morning. Uh, morning. Mr. Smotzer. Good morning, Scott. Uh, morning. Kenneth. Yeah. Good morning. Oh, oh shucks. <laughs> She's back I in the house. Director Jackson. <laughs> All right. Good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, and we have a presentation on the screen. Members have received a packet from Scott and RP as well. And I will turn it over to Kevin. Kevin? Sure. Good morning, uh, City Council, this distinguished members of City Council. Before you, we have a great project here uh, down along the Scranton Peninsula with a presentation in the flats. Uh, this is a request for a non-school TIF over a 30-year period to develop property that has been abandoned, oh, probably since the 70s maybe the 80s, former industrial property here. So we're gonna go through some uh, photos here and talk about the project. This is a residential housing project that will complement the most recently completed, uh, the Thunderbird project across the street where BrewDog is. That building had been vacant since the early 80s and was repurposed and has viability, activity, and jobs uh, across the street from that. So uh, if we can, we're gonna uh, uh, start the presentation and have the developer go over and talk about some of the photos, uh, what they've got proposed as part of the project, this residential housing project, and then some of the challenges uh, that they've had to deal with on uh, repurposing this project into a productive use. Thank you very much, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, for, thanks for the time this morning. My name is Scott Skinner, uh, Vice President of Development with the NRP Group. And before I talk about this project, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of what else we have going on in Cleveland, because this is just one part of a, of a much larger portfolio that we have. So the second page of the deck that you have, you see our, our mission, which is to create exceptional rental communities for individuals and families, regardless of income. Uh, NRP is a national developer, contractor, and property manager, but we're based here in Cleveland. We were founded here 27 years ago. Our offices are in Playhouse Square, and we've been developing affordable and market rate housing here uh, ever since. Uh, we're fully vertically integrated, which means for this project and for everything we do, we are the developer, general contractor, and, and will be the property manager as well. Uh, to give you an idea of you know, a similar market rate project that we've developed in the recent future, I think the next page has uh, a photo of the Edison at Gordon Square, uh, which was built in 2017 uh, in the Det Detroit Shoreway neighborhood. 306 units. It's currently 98% leased, and the, the number is 98 because we have one show unit in there. It, it's, it's completely full and, and, and has been really since we've opened. Um, we were, again, the developer, contractor, and manager. Um, and then for reasons that uh, will be evident in just a few minutes, uh, there's there's also a multi-purpose trail that goes directly through the site uh, under the shoreway and then connects to, to, to Edgewater on the other side as well. Um, a lot of what we have going on in Cle Cleveland right now is on the affordable side of our business. So there's three developments that are um, either under construction or leasing up uh, as we speak. Uh, the first is Via Sana, which has first residents moving into it in uh, about a two weeks. Uh, 72 units affordable to folks from 30% to 80% of the area median income. Um, our partner in the development is Metro Health. They're a co-owner, co-developer, and will be taking about 5,000 square feet of ground square, uh, 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 first floor space as well. Uh, the, second, the second example here is the Davis, which is 52 units of affordable housing, affordable to folks from 30 to 60% of AMI in the Glenville neighborhood. Uh, it's the site of the old Harry E. Davis School. Uh, and our partner in that development, who will also be taking ground floor space, is, is University Hospitals. That's currently under construction. Um, first resident should move in in about eight months. And the last example here is another development that's actively leasing up right now. First residents will actually move in in about 30 days, is the 5115 at the Rising, which is 88 affordable units in the Slavic Village neighborhood. Um, our, our partner in the development is University Settlement. Uh, they're a co-owner, co-developer. We'll be taking about 20,000 square feet of ground floor space. Uh, Tri-C will also be building an access center into the development, into the development and there will be a food pantry there as well. And then just quickly, uh, a couple other developments that I know the, the, the chair knows a few of these well uh, around Cleveland right now. Um, these are developed in the last uh, 15 years or so. So we have uh, two phases of development uh, in Euclid Green called the Residence as a Cornerstone. One is a senior development and one is a family development. Um, and then all, two additional senior developments, um, one in the Clark Fulton neighborhood, Foster Point, and then one um, the far side of Edgewater called A Place for Us. Now, finally, to get onto the actual project that we're talking about here today. So here is an image of where the site is. Like Kevin mentioned, uh, it's the cro across the street from the new brew dock on the Scranton Peninsula that has been vacant since the 70s. 
Uh, there is a ton of environmental remediation costs associated with the project that I'm happy to talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. Um, but the site is, uh, even though it's been vacant for a very long time, is centrally located and represents a really unique development opportunity to connect Tremont, Ohio City, and downtown. The next page shows the current image of the site. So you can see views um, on the, the right side of your page here, um, but the site is vacant. This, this satellite image is a few years old. Um, so directly across you'll, uh, is currently the brew dog. There's another development on the other side of Carter Road along the river. And then uh, Great Lakes Brewing Company owns the land immediately to the south of us on, on, on the, right side, the right side of your page there as well. Uh, I mentioned connectivity. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I personally am very excited about the project. You can see here uh, a, a map of how this site will help connect uh, Tremont, Ohio City, uh, and downtown. Um, the towpath trail goes directly through this site. Um, uh, an all-purpose trail will go directly along the front of our site that we're building as part of this development that will allow folks to be able to access it uh, via walking or via bike. Um, and the, uh, the Cleveland Lakefront Bikeway uh, is also connected through, through both of those trails as well. The next page is a site plan. So this development is 316 market rate units, uh, 301 apartments in two U-shaped buildings um, with, uh, that, are, that are open to, and there's a pool in one, amenities in the other, and then 15 townhomes. Uh, there, all those are three-story townhomes, they'll be for rent as well. Uh, you'll also notice two roads that we are building in as part of this development. The first is on the right side of your screen, um, and that is, will be a shared road with Great Lakes Brewing that will benefit both our site uh, and the Great Lakes site as well. And the second is not quite a road, but um, you can see it better on the next page as well, uh, a public plaza. Um, it will be at the start of uh, Lisa, will be closed with bollards to vehicular traffic uh, that we can use for programming. And you'll see sort of a grand staircase there uh, that will direct folks um, in that plaza down through the site across the street and eventually down to the riverfront as well. The next page, um, the next few page, pages are just images of the development. This one is from Carter Road. Uh, you're basically standing in the BrewDog parking lot, and that's the image you're going to be seeing along Carter Road down there. And then the following page, again, is that grand staircase that I mentioned that exits onto a multi-purpose trail, um, and then will hopefully direct folks uh, down to the Riverfront Trail as well. Uh, last image is just another um, uh, rendering of what the development will look like. Uh, it was passed at Planning Commission earlier this year. The final page, um, the final page uh, that we wanted to show you is, uh, again, an overview of what the development actually looks like now, or what the site, excuse me, actually looks like now in these photos, and then just uh, a bit of a rationale for this TIF that we are requesting here, it's a uh, non-school TIF. So one, um, given the nature of the site, the, the TIF itself is critical to the economic viability of the project, happy to talk more about that and answer questions about that. And the main reason for that is there's about $11 million in environmental remediation and site work costs for this development. Um, and without the TIF, it would be in, in, impossible to actually finance it um, and, and get the development built. Uh, additionally, you know, like I mentioned, it went through in some of these images, uh, a, many parts of this development will benefit the general public, uh, the multi-purpose trail along the front of it, uh, the plaza, and the grand staircase that will direct folks down to the riverfront. Um, and you know, we're conf investment begets investment, and we're confident that this will continue to spur uh, activity down on the Scranton Peninsula and around it. So I'll stop there, because that was a lot of information, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Uh, Scott, thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, definitely recognize some of the other uh, developments <laughs> in, your, uh, in your presentation, all uh, good developments that happen uh, over on the northeast side. Thank you. Anything from uh, Kevin? No, I think uh, uh, Scott uh, outlined this project and including some of the other projects that uh, the NRP uh, group has invested in our uh, respective neighborhoods there. I think we would be open up some questions from everyone. Sure. Director, anything? No, I mean, I just want to reiterate some of Scott's points that this is not a selective develop developer in that they're just trying to cherry pick the best projects. They're really working across the city, trying to create opportunities everywhere, creating affordable housing, partnering with local organizations. And I really support some of the work that they're doing. And I've had other conversations with Scott about how he can really be 
how the company can actually be better corporate citizens and help the city kind of further some of our goals in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I completely support this project. Thank you very much, and, Good. Thank you, Director. Uh, before we move to the committee for questions, can you uh, go through uh, just some project details, uh, the, the unit mix, uh, cost of the project, and, and so forth? Sure. Um, a few things uh, in, in the write-up that we've uh, looked at with Director Jackson and myself on this is uh, the estimated costs of the project, the construction costs, the remediation, consulting fees, uh, environmental costs uh, it, it total up to just a hair under a hundred million. It's a little over that when you start calculating in some other things like construction interests and things like that. Um, they are still going to have some jobs associated with this project, uh, even though it's a housing project, but there are going to be uh, five full-time jobs associated with the project. The value of the TIF uh, that we, uh, that's been estimated over the 30-year term is $2,359,000, which still doesn't equate to the $11.2 million just to get the project uh, remediated geotechnical issues before you even start putting any beams or anything like that in the ground. So it, it knocks on the door, but it still doesn't uh, get to the total cost of that. Um, the and amount of acreage is about 7.4 acres, too. So it's a sizable amount of acreage that's over there that's just been abandoned since the 1970s. And, Chair, to your question on the unit mix, uh, 183 one-bedrooms, 117 two-bedrooms, and 16 three-bedrooms. 16 three-bedrooms. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Kevin, as well. You said five new four-time W-2 jobs um, in the city of Cleveland. Um, they are subject to Chapter 187, 188 yes. uh, as well, correct? All right. That is correct. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll open it up to the committee. You want to defer or you want to uh, go down? Start. Okay, Councilman McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and Director. Thank you for bringing this forward today. Appreciate it, Kevin. You too, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as was well, first of all, it's good to see three Ward three residents sitting in front of me today. <laughs> there you go. Same street. Absolutely. Never. Yeah, you guys do live on the on same, same street. street. That's yeah. kind of funny. Uh, um, but <laughs> and we didn't know each other until this project. That's the same. Yes, but um, committed problem. City of Cleveland no, residents. Absolutely. City of Cleveland residents. We like to see City of Cleveland residents in front of us. This so is a good start of a street club. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's right, exactly. <laughs> our, our neighborhood does not have a challenge with active street clubs. <laughs> Anyways, um, so uh, Mr. Chairman, again, um, so, so a lot was said about this project, but I would just note that, um, as was noted, this is on vacant land um, in the flats that has been like this for many, many years. Um, you know, when we think about a TIF, we think about a financial burden on a developer, and there is no doubt that this land here needs significant environmental remediation and infrastructure um, to make this reality. This is not a green field out, you know, 45 minutes outside of the city of Cleveland where you pull a permit and build. There is a lot uh, that has to happen here on this site to make this happen. The other thing I would note, Mr. Chairman, and, and by no means, Scott, this is not a reflection on the developer, but this project in a demonstration of that uh, need has had starts and stops yep. because of financial struggles uh, to get it up and running, not on their side, but because of the market and all of the costs that's gonna go into this site. With that said, Mr. Chairman, um, I think that uh, this is a critically important piece to kind of jumpstart this uh, redevelopment of this peninsula, which again, historically has kind of been closed off from the community. Uh, and this is really a way to invigorate uh, and to bring life down here to the Scranton Peninsula. Um, so again, uh, we've got a reputable developer that's done a lot of um, housing of different levels. Um, and, you know, hopefully I've pushing these guys to get me some low-income senior housing in Ward 3. So that's an <laughs> ongoing conversation that we're, I think, excited about. But again, Mr. Chair, I think there is a, um, a lot of justification here and uh, really a project that's going to need a lot of upfront investment before they even, you know, put a brick on the, on the, on the site. Um, uh, to Chair to Scott, did we get that multi-purpose trail in the front that I've been yelling at you for about for three years? Yes, we did. Uh, okay. was, part, was part of our planning commission approval. Okay, so uh, Chief, we're good with the multi-purpose trail in the front? This is before your time, my man. So <laughs> long story short, um, the, I, we got a lot of pushback from the previous administration about having a multi-purpose trail in the front. 
Um, so I just want to make sure, though, that the city director is good with the multi-purpose. I know you're not planning. That's why I'm kind of looking at both it's here, a, but... It, it's about an 8 to 10 foot sidewalk, basically, that, that right. also acts as a trail. It's wider, so uh, bikes and pedestrians can access wonderful, it at the same time. Wonderful, That's great. So thank, thank you. Thank you to the new administration. Uh, we wanted to put one of these in before, and we got a significant amount of pushback. So I'm glad that the new, new administration's on board with that. That was important to the panel and to everyone because this is a critical connector. Um, for bikes and pedestrians along this stretch, and we wanted to make sure that it was, and the development team was on board with it. We just had, for some reason, pushed back previously. So glad to see that's gone through. That's another public amenity for the, the community uh, to have as well. So again, Mr. Chairman, I think, once again, um, uh, this, I believe and agree that uh, this TIF is very much justifiable, and this will be uh, a very positive investment on a vacant, site that needs significant environment, environmental remediation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman uh, McCormick. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Uh, Councilwoman uh, Spencer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to be with everybody this morning. Um, Likewise. This is, um, there, have been a num there are a number of slides that, that show the, the area. This, I've always found um, this part of Councilman McCormick's ward to be a little confusing geographically for myself. So this is my chance to understand what's going on in the Scranton Peninsula. Because I feel like there's a lot of, I'd love to understand the context and I really would love to understand um, the trail as well. Sure. So the slide, I think it's a couple slides prior, that's the, um, maybe not just a couple, the one that's the Metro Parks, mm -hmm. yes. So um, is the, I'm just gonna stand up. Is this the new trail that you that's correct, yes. Yeah. So that goes along Carter Road on our site, on our side of the site, um, past the Great Lakes land just to the south of us, uh, across about half of our site. And this was the recommendation uh, from Matt Moss with planning as we were going through the process. Uh, crosses over, basically where the staircase is in our site, onto the uh, side of the other developer. Um, and the trail continues along their side of the street. And when you say that, uh, through the chair to Mr. Skinner, when you say the other developer, um, who, who are you referring to? Uh, there's another developer, I believe the Edwards Group chair, um, that is developing the site across the street from ours. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. It's just a really interesting, how, <laughs> there's a lot of puzzle pieces here. So, um, so that one, the thin purple trail is yet to be built. That is Correct. That, that will be part of our development, Councilwoman and Chair. Okay. And so it's included in your project costs and your development costs? Correct. Okay, that's good news. Um, and then the going back to where we were. Sorry, Kevin, I'm not a good backseat driver. Uh, <laughs> Go, going forward, sure. kind of to the slide where we were. Um, oh, sorry. Um, like exit from that. It's the slide with, um, <coughs> it's actually where we were before, so I should have just started there. Final slide. It's this one. There, okay. So, um, Scott, can you, or through the chair to Mr. Skinner, can you show again what you just described with the purple, where that is? Sure. Um, uh, Chair, it is along the front of the two U-shaped buildings you see with blue yep. arrows coming out of them. The per and then where does the purple connect? Uh, right, right in front of those. So the, um, is, is it okay if I stand up as well to show you, Councilwoman? Is that, if that's easier? <laughs> Maybe, sure. yeah. Sure. Hey, Scott, for yeah. the viewing public, our clerk's got a mic oh. so that the folks oh. that are watching on TV can hear you. Yes. There, um, goes along here in front of our site, and then here is where that plaza of the staircase is, crosses over to this side of the Carter Road, and then continues continues along here to cross the bridge. Okay. Okay. Got it. So just so the uh, through the chair you're referencing that it that it just crosses the road at the side of the staircase, but continues. Okay. That's correct. Yes. Okay. And then. Um, 
do we, uh, this is maybe not a question for the developer, do we know uh, if Great Lakes has any active plans for their site? Maybe that can't be disclosed. Okay, let's just hang uh, That Never mind, I'm, that, that doesn't need to be discussed in today's hearing. And then um, Silver Hills at Thunderbird do you want, do you want is, no. So Silver Hills at Thunderbird um, is a different developer, right? A different development, a different Correct. developer. Okay. Um, on the other side, so through the chair, your your development does not actually have a direct riverfront. It's adjacent, but not direct on the riverfront. Uh, Councilman and Chairperson, that, that's correct. So if you look at the bottom image there, that's Carter Road. Our development is on the right side of the screen, and Silver Hills is on the left side of the screen. Um, and then through the chair, do we know if Silver Hills is going to, will there be public access to the riverfront? Is there any event? Okay. Yeah. I know this is all in great hands with <laughs> Councilman McCormick, the best advocate for, for all Chair, of this, but I just, hey, this is my chance to, no, to I, figure out this part of, <laughs> I've never gotten it. Yeah. May I have a quick point on that? Absolutely. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I will just say that, uh, and I'll speak for Ward 3, any waterfront development in Ward 3, I will not think of, sneeze on, talk to if they don't have public access to the waterfront. That is a hard stop. I know the mayor's administration shares that value. So anytime we're looking at the waterfront, um, it must have public access. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, thank you for my, my tutorial here on the, uh, it's, this is the Carter Peninsula, correct? That's what the area is called overall? Scranton. Scranton Peninsula. Okay, Carter correct. Road, Scranton Peninsula, got it. Um, <laughs> so thank you for my tutorial on Scranton Peninsula. Um, Mr. Chair, I think I had another question, but it, mm -hmm. no, it, it flew out of my head, yeah. so okay. you can, In. thank you. Uh, Councilwoman, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning. I had an opportunity to work with NRP um, in one of the projects via SANA, and I would say I have to share this experience. I mean, it was it totally exceeded my expectation. Beautiful apartments. Um, I think they're almost full. Um, uh, I do want to thank our partnership and your community engagement, and I asked for them to do bilingual um, workers there so they could you know, register um, mm -hmm. residents that didn't speak the language and they did all of that. They checked all those boxes. But through the chair to Scott, is this, did you say this is a mixed income affordable unit? Uh, uh, chair and councilman, this is a, a solely market rate development. Oh, okay, just Correct. market rate. Okay, then that's <laughs> All right, councilwoman, any further questions for the committee? Councilman Harsh. Thank you, chairman. Uh, I think this is a terribly exciting uh, project. Uh, I'm a big proponent of growth mentality in Cleveland and adding a couple hundred more units to our, our, our portfolio as a city will either relieve pressure in the housing market or bring new people to our city, both of which are good things. I just have one basic question on the very last page where we see the purple line. Um, the, the, the railroad track that comes up the east side of the development project and curves around, that's a functional, that's, a, that's an active railroad. Track. Yes or no? Uh, uh, the chair? Councilman and Chair, uh, historically it has been a uh, semi-active railroad. Um, when we started working on this development back in 2018, um, I think there was one train that went there every week. There was literally someone whose job it was was to go unlock the fence so the train could, could get through and keep going. Um, I, I don't believe it is currently uh, active, um, but I could, could be wrong about that. And through the chair, uh, do we know who owns it? Is it who's the railroad operator? I'm honestly not sure which, uh, which railroad company owns that. I, I believe the intention when we went through the planning process um, was that eventually um, that could possibly become some sort of public trail access point, but we, we don't control that part of the land, so um, I, I can't really speak to it. Councilman, and Chair. Mr. Chair, I'm only asking because um, the uh, trail proposal that cuts east to west along the southern portion of the development site would have to go over that train track, Correct. which is historically difficult um, to work with, <laughs> with uh, train operators. But it would be very nice to make that uh, whole peninsula a lot more navigable. I ride my bike down there sometimes, and it's uh, mm -hmm. you have to circle the whole thing to get to cut across if you're just sure. trying to. Mm -hmm. So that'd, that'd be really nice if we could get yeah. across that train track. Absolutely, uh, uh, Chairman and, and Councilman. Um, uh, the intention as we are going through the planning process with the, with the city for the last several years was uh, finding a combination of how we can make a great development right now and how we can set the table for what this Grand Peninsula could look like in the future. And that, that road that bisects our site and the Great Lakes site mm -hmm. um, on the right side of the, uh, of, of the image, which is the, so the southern portion of our site, the intention for that is one, it is for access for our residents and for, for, uh, for Great Lakes Brewing. Um, but two, if something ever does happen with the railroad in the future, which could be 
two years, it could be 32 years. Um, the, the infrastructure of sort of a grid is in place. And that was a, a, a long back and forth um, with design review uh, and then with planning commission as well. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, it's an exciting project. I'm glad to see it. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Harris. Any further questions from the committee? Councilwoman House. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Through the chair uh, to the director, so I'm always the person when we talk about market rate, what is that actual number? Sure. Um, the rents will range from uh, $1,800 up to about $3,780. Okay, so that's market rate. Jesus. Okay, all right. Um, other question is when we, um, and that's 1800 that starts from the one bedroom, correct? correct. Okay. What's the square you? Is it on here? Um, I don't believe it's on there. Okay. Uh, I have the data in front of me, the square footage. A majority of the one bedrooms are what we call one bedroom dens. So they're, they're pretty large one okay. bedrooms. And we see that especially post COVID as being a, a huge demand. Mm -hmm. um, the actual square footage range from a uh, under, little under 600 on the low end. And the, the townhomes we talked about are 2,100 square feet. Okay. That's a large one. All right. Thank you. And then um, I'm just following up um, through the chair. Um, Asking the question around um, with a $100 million project, I know we we're talking about having different goals, and I guess I would just be interested in understanding what is your process of including, um, uh, uh, you know, minority, your underrepresented underrepresented contractors, subcontractors, sure. things of that nature. What is just your your philosophy and process, seeing that you have the whole um, gamut of being the developer, general contractor, and property management? If you can share that process with us in philosophy. Sure, Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, Chairperson, um, Chairman, and, and, and Councilwoman, thank you. That's, that's a really thoughtful question. Um, so from a logistical standpoint, uh, the TIF is, is attached to a community benefits agreement where we will have goals for um, MBE, WBE, and Section 3 hiring. I'm happy to give you information on the other three projects that we have under construction in Cleveland right now and where we are with each of those goals. Um, our, our philosophy is these are, these are all things that we want to do. It benefits everyone uh, to have more Cleveland-based companies working on these developments. And um, I had a conversation with the director that I hope you don't mind me sharing re re recently where we are we're actively working with the city to see what we can do uh, to train up a larger subcontractor base. One of the challenges that we have is when we're looking for Cleveland-based subcontractors, both uh, uh, minority business-owned enterprises and, frankly, minority workers on the site, um, that subcontractor base uh, is not as developed as it could be in Cleveland. Um, we recently started a, um, with a, a, another developer a property management school uh, at CSU, and we're, we're actively working with the city to see you know, what could that possibly look like um, on the subcontractor contractor side. So I think that, that the philosophy is that you know, when that market doesn't exist, we are trying to take act, active steps to, uh, to, to make sure that it can. I know we have um, a couple folks internally on our team whose sole job is to strengthen our minority-owned subcontractor uh, pipeline and hiring practices. I believe um, they've been working with Zachary quite closely over the last uh, six months. Um, and so when you, just to follow up through the chair, um, when you talked about the subcontractor pool not being um, kind of what it needs to be, what can you just expound a little bit upon that? What does that mean? Uh, sure, Chairman. Um, what we mean by that is that the, the, the amount of Cleveland-based subcontractors that we would need to do really large-scale projects like this, you know, you're talking $100 million or even $40, $50 million dollar developments, um, that's not a, the, that market is not as strong as we see in other markets. And I think there's an opportunity uh, to help bridge that gap. Okay. Um, okay. So that, and then um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what are the profits um, that your company in general will be making um, off this off this deal? Uh, sure, um, Chairman. It's uh, there's a development fee associated with it. There's a general contracting fee associated with it, and then this is conventionally financed. So we will have a lender who will uh, charge us interest, and, and we will have equity partners who will invest and take returns as well. What's the percentage, if you would like to share? I, I, I'm not able to share that at that time. Okay, Councilwoman. All right. Thank you. All right, Councilwoman. Any further questions from the committee? Councilwoman Spencer. 
Thank you. Again, just taking advantage of a learning moment. Um, quick question, um, not directly related to the project. When we um, went through slides looking at NRP's other projects, just very curious to know, um, through the chair to Scott, when, when NRP is looking at projects, there's a couple that are family, mm -hmm. um, that are there are several that are for families, and then would this also be in that family category, and why or why not? Sure. Um, thank you, Councilwoman and Chairman. Um, the developments that we've done here that are for seniors, um, you, there, there's a, on the affordable side of our business, there's a, a complicated um, evaluation criteria to get tax credits and subsidies and all these things that we need from the state of Ohio. Uh, in certain years, um, senior developments in urban areas are, are looked at more favorably by the state, and we look for senior opportunities. Uh, in certain years, family developments are looked at more favorably. And uh, the example, Chairman of Residences at Cornerstone, when we first developed it, um, the state of Ohio was really looking for more senior development in that neighborhood. And when we went back for a second phase 10 years later, uh, the state had incentivized us and encouraged us to do more family developments in that area. So it's really based off of the, uh, the, the subsidies that we're looking for on the affordable side of the business. This development specifically is not age restricted. Um, I can tell you from a market perspective, uh, there will be some seniors that live in this development. Um, we see a lot of folks moving in uh, from the suburbs to some of the townhomes, for example. Um, but it will not be age restricted. And we expect a majority of tenants to be um, uh, in their 30s and 40s. Thanks. And then. Um through the chair, what is the unit mix in terms of it's 300 plus units and then what's the mix? Thank you, Chairman. It is uh, 183 one bedrooms, 117 two bedrooms, and 16 three bedrooms. Thanks, Mr. Chair. All right. You're welcome. Uh, Councilman House. Thank you. Just a follow up and I'm going to give a, through the chair, um, to our guest here, I'm going to give context of why I ask questions because people don't realize why I ask the questions that I ask. So um, I know we are on this phase for uh, council to um, start. We are getting into the work of developing like a standard for our um, CBA's community benefit agreements. And um, I know that the last time a disparity study was done in the city of Cleveland was back in 2000. 2012, um, and it was a lot in the report, but basically it was just saying that basically it's a strong inference of discriminatory behavior coming to our uh, um, minority contractors. That's the summary of it. And so just trying to understand people's philosophy. The reason why I was asking about what the profits were is because, again, in this general uh, conversation regarding inflation, Right, everybody is talking about inflation. And one of the things, at least that have been put out, is that inflation is not uh, necessarily happening as a result of prices significantly uh, in Christ, you know, um, increasing. A, a significant portion of inflation that we are feeling is just based on the profits of companies from shareholders and owners. And many times, publicly, we are not having these conversations. And, um, you know, you all just happen to be the first people that I talk to. But again, this is something that I will be um, talking to everybody about. Because again, I think we have to begin to have conversations about when is enough enough? And at to what expense? You know, is it, is it hindering people's ability just to have a good life? Um, and, and, you know, I always come through the viewpoint of average household income now of Ward 7 residents, it went up $1,000, it's $20,991. If the folks in Ward 7 can't live here, be here, you know, um, like many other Clevelanders, like what are we doing? And so um, I, I feel like we have to have a level of partnership for our private companies to be more forthcoming about how much money you are making. Because again, if reports are telling us all these prices are being driven because a level, and I think at the end of it, greed or whatever, and I'm not saying that your company, I'm talking about in the global sense, um, we in Cleveland need to have some more conversations and look to a place of how do we come to some a level of common sense, fairness, trueness, there has to be limits to that stuff. And so it's no, no shade on your group, your company, or whatever, but I do think we have to begin to have these conversations, especially in a place like Cleveland where it's just a layer effect. You know that subcontractors aren't getting the opportunity to, to, to fully participate in this economic system, people making 
you know, make it money, money, while the people who have been here all the time for generations can't benefit. We just have to have a level of real progress, right? And because we do, you know, people can't wait another 10 years, 20 years. Like, there are things that we need to be doing now and should have should have been doing to really write in the table so that people aren't in such desperate situations. So I, I just let me I just want to, you know, for the audience, for you all to understand this is where I'm coming from. We have a body of work that is telling us what is happening in our city and we need people um, at the table. Like I don't feel like we should be begging nobody to, to 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 come up with some goals. You tell me what your philosophy is and you show me what your work is and that will speak volumes because if anybody in 2022 and beyond got to tell you what you need to do in a city like Cleveland, that's, that's to me, that's, that's silly. So I, I just wanted to give that context thank from you. people who did um, So thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Director. Yes. yes. Um, to the council, um, through the chair, to the Councilwoman, I would say that um, it is the philosophy of economic development that we incentivize and we support opportunity. We don't subsidize and support profits for the sake of profit taking. We are pushing back on developers. We are um, being more stringent in our underwriting. We are looking at actual costs and we are trying and we are looking at reasonable costs. And like and we're not in the business of putting people out of business. However, we are in the business of making sure that when we support projects, it's because there's a genuine need and that these are projects that are going to benefit the community. To that end, we're looking internally at our underwriting processes. We're looking at our turn and prop uh, internally at our vetting processes. How do we look at these deals? How do we prioritize projects that are going to bring community benefits with developers that are good corporate citizens? So to that end, I can say that there's a lot of work that does need to be done. And but the department is doing the work and to make sure that people aren't benefiting off just the backs of poverty and and taking advantage of a situation. We're pushing back with OEO on developers that are saying that they can't meet their goals and just challenging them on what the processes look like. To that end, Scott and I have had conversations about how do we upfront make sure, you know, doing pre-bid meetings putting together the scope of work in advance, making sure that everybody is aware of the opportunity in advance so that basically when you, if you come to OEO and you come to economic development and say, well, we couldn't meet this goal, I'm going to basically see what is your good faith effort. I need to see that you've, 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 made, you've had these meetings, you've invited people to the table, you've given them a chance to bid, and if that doesn't work, that just demonstrates to the department, to the city, that we have work on our end. And like I said, this is both a supply side issue and a demand side issue. Demand from the contractors and supply side from the city and the community to basically shore up the pool of contractors. And to that end, as you guys know, we are already working on trying to figure out how do we create more bonding and more, um, more um, lines of credit opportunities for minority contractors. There are training opportunities. We're trying to do the same thing with minority developers. I've actually had conversations with Scott about things that they've done in other markets that have worked. So um, I just want to assure um, the, the whole entire council that the work is being done. So hopefully in a year, some of these issues and some of these concerns will be alleviated by the council. So. All right. Thank you, Director. All good uh, comments. And, you know, we had this discussion uh, many times, and you know, I look forward to uh, our work together. All right. Anything further from you, Scott? Uh, no, Chair. All right. Thank you. Any further questions from the committee? Seeing no further questions from the committee, Ordinance Number 1040-2022 stands approved. Thank you all. all thank right. you very much. Thank you. Start with you. All right. Uh, Assuming Kevin, you're saying? All right. And next we will hear ordinance number 1039-2022 by council members McCormick, Harrison, and Griffin by departmental request. An emergency ordinance authorizing the mayor and the commission of purchases and supplies to acquire and reconvey properties presently owned by 1209 Fairfield LLC or its designee located at 1111 Fairfield Avenue for the purposes purpose of entering into the chain of title prior to the adoption of tax increment financing legislation authorized under section 5709.41 of the revised code for the Driftwood Mixed Use Development Project. Good morning again. 
Good morning uh, to the chair and to uh, distinguished council. Uh, before you, I have to my immediate right is Adam Comer. He's the project manager uh, for the 1209 Fairfield LLC project. And then we have one of the principals, Nick Catanz, right? He's one of the uh, uh, developing uh, managing members of this project. What we have here before you is a uh, presentation for the development of property that has been vacant in the heart of the Tremont neighborhood over at Fairfield and uh, West 14th Street. Uh, if any of you have been down over at several of our small business restaurants that are over there, uh, caddy corner to this uh, property is a uh, vacant property that's there and um, uh, that's been vacant for some time. It's a parking lot I think that people have taken their risk in parking their automobiles on. Uh, but this is going to be developed before you as a mixed use development project. Uh, when this first came before us, um, one of the first things that we came about was having a community meeting and this uh, project before you with this 30 year uh, TIF. They took the advice and they met with Tremont West and they had multiple community meetings. And before you that the developer is going to present came about a better uh, project based upon some of the community meetings, their input and thoughts. So I just wanted to share that with you, uh, which is very important. Um, this is 130,000 square foot also of additional housing, but it also will have a mixed use component of a retail storefront that will be part of that, that will reflect across the street from some of the commercial uh, components, Loop Coffee and uh, Parallax uh, Restaurant, which has been there for 15 years. I, I will turn this over to the developers to uh, give you more of a, a presentation about their project before you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Just a reminder to our guests, all questions flow through the Chair. And as you heard uh, from previous um, uh, uh, presenters and also from council members, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good morning, uh, council members. Appreciate the time. Um, so just to kind of quickly walk you through the presentation we have, uh, this shows the site. Uh, as, um, as Kevin mentioned, it's, it's at the corner of West 11th and Fairfield. Um, it's kind of the missing corner uh, at, at uh, more or less a, an iconic corner there in Tremont with Loop Coffee, Parallax, and Southside Restaurant um, on the adjacent corners. If you could flip to the next slide. Um, again, a little bit zoomed in there, showing you the location of the site. Uh, this is just showing sort of the, the building layout, um, letting you know kind of where, where the, the residential component would be. The, the mixed use um, retail component would be on the hard corner of West 11th and, uh, and Fairfield, which you'll see a little bit later in the presentation. Some context images showing you the location. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the, the parking oh, lot there. Um, yeah, you know exactly okay. where it is. You've probably parked there if you've uh, <laughs> if you've gone to Southside. Um, it's not the it's not the best looking. It's a Jeep course. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's the cheapest one there is. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not the most beautiful parking lot uh, in the world, um, but I'm sure we've all parked there. So that kind of gives you a little bit of context on on, on where the site is located. Um, a little bit more context there. And this showing those adjacent properties, obviously Parallax, Southside, and Loop on the three adjacent corners. Um, so here's uh, some rendered images of the proposed building. Um, this, I believe, is looking west, uh, sort of down or up Fairfield. Um, again, that retail component that we're proposing would be on that hard corner that, that we see here. Um, and then the, the residential units around and above it. Um, currently, we're actually proposing a little bit of a larger retail space, so roughly 3,000 square feet. Um, this also shows, uh, you know, some community shared space within the building. Um, just to, to bring, uh, with all of our developments, we want to we want to bring um, community not just within the building, but but also without. So this gives some good uh, community share space for the the residents of the building to use. Uh, parking was uh, is is and always will be um, something that came up in, in neighborhood uh, meetings that Kevin mentioned. We had several of those, um, and a big concern um, was parking, which did lead us to to acquire um, those adjacent two properties. Um, that was a big factor in that, um, and and in acquiring those two properties, we now have more space to to uh, to build a, a larger structured parking, um, as well as what we'll show on the next slide is um, some proposed exterior. Uh, surface lot parking as well. Again, some images of the building um, just to show uh, sort of uh, where the, des uh, the design is at currently. You can feel free to, s to slide through these, Kevin. Okay. Um, this shows that retail component uh, in more detail. So um, 
as we're as we're working through uh, and and sort of uh, imagining this this retail component, um, it's currently shown as as a restaurant, and, and our goal is to activate that corner uh, and make it again a benefit for not just the building um, but also for uh, the community and, and Cleveland as a whole. And feel free to slip flow through. So just to, uh, on unit counts, um, this, the building will have uh, studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, as well as two uh, three bedroom units. Roughly 100 units total. Yeah, what is this here? Well, the bottom level. So this is another image of the uh, retail space uh, proposed at the hard corner of West 11th and Fairfield. This would be on West 11th, um, looking into uh, uh, what is shown as a, as a restaurant space. Um, so again, we want to we want to bring the space onto the street. We want to activate that street corner. It's sort of the missing piece um, with the three ad adjacent uh, retail components uh, on the other corners. So um, we want this to be something that draws that draws the neighborhood in and and is is really a, a benefit to the the community as a whole. This shows uh, entrance into our structured parking, which uh, will, will be off of West 11th. Um, and again, a, a component of that uh, being able to, to include as many parking uh, stalls as we were able was, was acquiring those, uh, those two houses to the south. Right. Is that it? Yeah. Correct. So specific to, to um, uh, obviously, with construction costs being high, there's some really specific things with this uh, project that um, that have sort of been added costs. Acquiring those two lots were one of them. Um, we worked closely with those neighbors. Uh, one of the, the neighbors in the house is an elderly couple, has lived there for a very, very long time. Um, we assisted in their, their moving uh, process uh, with some of the costs there as well. Um, and, and ultimately help them relocate into what is now a better situation. Um, we, we certainly paid uh, probably more than, you know, over market for those homes, um, uh, as well as the, the moving costs that went along with that. Um, demo costs for those particular houses are, are an added additional cost as well, um, roughly $40,000. Uh, and the total cost of acquiring those, those two homes was roughly $720,000 as well. Do you have any specific? No, I would, <clears throat> I would just add to that that um, in this market, in this day and age, these projects are, become, are becoming more and more challenging. And when you look at a site like this that has sat vacant for a long time and is such a key site in the location of Tremont and the dynamics of Tremont, it is a site that is worth you know, figuring out a way to make, make the numbers work and make, make the development happen. And for us, the TIF is such a large component of that because without the TIF right now, there really wouldn't be a project. I mean, it's just the reality of, of the nature of where the market is and where the costs are and rents are. So we appreciate your consideration. We appreciate um, all the efforts today. I know we've met Carrie multiple times with you about this project and tried to address all the concerns that the residents and the community and the city had it, with the design and and Kevin has been a huge help, and we, we feel like this is a great project. It will be a great project. We just need a little bit of assistance to really make it happen. Thank you uh, both. Thank you, Kevin, for your presentation. Director uh, Jackson, anything? Uh, <coughs> um, through the chair um, to the council, I just want to point out that one of the big issues in that neighborhood was having parking for some of the other residential businesses, I mean the retail businesses, and that the developers have basically tried to accommodate that in their design and making more parking accessible to the actual community. So this will actually um, reduce the strain on those businesses and actually give them access to customers that are coming into the area that looking for places to park. So that's just one point. And I want to also point out that um, this TIF really is going to be used to do kind of infrastructure environmental work. So it's not just a, just a plain old, here developer, here's some subsidy to, to offset your deferred developer fee or your um, your project management cost, this really is going to support infrastructure related costs associated with the project. So 
Thank you, Director. Uh, Kevin. Uh, to the chairperson, one other thing that uh, we just uh, failed to mention on this is uh, where the parking lot also is. They found out not too long ago that there are some former homes that were demolished back in the 70s and 80s that uh, they're buried. Mm -hmm. So that has also added that's, to significant cost yes. uh, as part of this that they found out, uh, and not only the homes, but the uh, utility lines too. But they're buried down there, so that all has to be taken out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was our practice back then. Yep. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Uh, and 187, 188 is subject to this uh, as well? Yes, correct. All right, uh, Council McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as was noted, you got a good uh, overview of the project itself. Um, this is another project that has been eight years in the making under different ownership than you guys, but yeah, um, longer than that. maybe longer 10. than that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just a project that has not been able to get off the ground. So um, thank you director and your team for helping put this together so we can finally um, see this project to fruition. Um, as was noted, um, this is, I, I was gonna say a surface parking lot, but it's not even really a surface parking lot, but a, a vacant underutilized um, uh, lot within the neighborhood. Um, and uh, once again, um, the TIF will uh, TIF on future value, not existing. Uh, so if this project were not to happen, um, we would not realize not only the benefits of the project, but the additional revenues that the project brings in as well. Um, so once again, um, given the uh, benefits of the projects itself is bringing to the community as well as the cleanup and otherwise here, um, support this uh, for uh, this exciting project to hopefully turn um, this long um, awaited project for the neighborhood and the community to fruition. I will also note that um, uh, just as a, a, a question that might come up for folks in the area, um, Southside, which is a beloved community neighborhood restaurant across the street, um, utilized this lot, but they did build a lot next to their um, business to accommodate as well. Right. Um, and as the director noted, um, there we do have struggles with parking in the neighborhood, so we appreciate that. Um, white biking and walking is always your best route anyway, but uh, we welcome folks that do come into the neighborhood in a vehicle. And um, once again, um, I know that the owners of Southside, who are longtime owners, also support this project as well. Um, they're right across the street. Uh, so do want to point that out, that they're excited about this coming online. Again, a longtime neighborhood business in the community. So uh, again, Mr. Chair, I know the neighborhood's exciting to see this project come to fruition, um, and I support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman McCormick. Uh, and Kevin, if you can, uh, the TIF amount and the total uh, cost of the description that Director Jackson gave us. Sure. To the chairperson, the, uh, the, the estimated TIF amount is $786,790. And the estimated pre-development cost, the cost to tear out the foundations of the homes, environmental asbestos remediation, tear down the two homes, acquisition of the homes, and to prepare the, the land just uh, before you put the uh, the pillars in the ground is uh, a little over 1.2 million. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Committee, any questions? Councilwoman Spencer. Good to see everyone today. See nice you. to see you, Nick. Um, uh, I think it was useful context with the last project for the committee to hear um, the unit mix and um, expected rents. So through the chair, could you talk? Uh, so it's. Um, the unit count, 102 total units, correct? And then I think it would be um, as important context for us to hear the mix and then the projected rents. Adam, Nicholas. Sure, so as far as unit mix, um, yeah, 102 units um, with roughly 20 studios, um, 65 one bedroom units, roughly 15 two bedrooms, and then we do have two larger three bedroom units as well. Um, with regards to, to rents, uh, the project will be mostly, uh, mostly market rate um, with uh, roughly on the, the, the low end, uh, 1,400 to um, with, with the three bedroom units um, pushing, pushing four or $5,000 per month. Councilwoman. Thank, no, thank you for the context. Thank you. Now, uh, did you say $5,000 a month? Yes. Yes. Through the chair. For a three bedroom. Uh, for one of the, for the there are two three bedroom units which could be up to five thousand dollars a month is what I understand. Right. Correct. All right. Thank you, Adam. Um, you said mostly market rate, and so when I mostly there's a part of this that is affordable, or 
not as high as uh, the other rents? Adam, Nicholas? There's a workforce housing component that the last project we did in Tremont was the electric gardens project. And oh, you did electric gardens. Within okay. the community benefits agreement, there was uh, you know, a requirement to have 10 or 15% of the units as workforce housing, and we've had discussions about that same arrangement for this project. So the studios um, will go for anywhere from 1100 1200 a month to 1400 $1,500 a month. And so those numbers, based on 80% AMI, uh, fall within that workforce housing category. Thank you. And Kevin, is that, is that in line with uh, what they produced on the other project, Electric Gardens? To the chairperson, the Electric Gardens project was a great successful project, uh, just uh, everything across the board on that. Um, yes, they, uh, I, I'm waiting confirmation on that, but they have worked uh, uh, on, on getting that. I've had a lot of follow-up on that, including MBE, FBE, and CSB participation that I just had a discussion with OEO on the other day, uh, that they are close to closing that out, but there has been a significant and progress uh, uh, a meeting on that uh, on that project. The project also also was supposed to just create five jobs. They have far exceeded that on the number of jobs from uh, the limelight incubator that they have in there, the coffee shop, and then the number of people that just have to work at the site to manage it from leasing agent, property management, and all of that. Um, so they've exceeded the job numbers on that project. So, But I would recommend anybody to get a tour of that. And that site down there on the hillside had been vacant a few years after the Civil War. Um, I mean, it had been vacant that long, and it, it connected to the towpath trail uh, for community benefit for that particular project. It, it, it is quite amazing on that. So, yes, 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 and I think yes. All right, thank you. Um, Councilwoman House, Councilman Harsh. All right. Okay, thank you. Good question. So this, again, this brings me up to another question. Um, do the chair... Good morning, gentlemen. Um, question, when we talk about creating jobs, um, what kind of jobs, what kind of, can the, would the people working at the job be able to live there? Like, w w tell me, like, are these um, family sustaining jobs? Like, would you be, where are you gonna be able to live if you work there? So I would say that the, the jobs that get created from a project of this scale would be one full-time property manager <coughs> that would also handle some of the leasing responsibilities. <coughs> and in some of our other projects, that individual does live in the building. It doesn't mean that they are required to, but that position probably pays, you know, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, and that would be plenty of income to be able to pay the rents to live in, you know, one bedroom unit in the building. Uh, on the retail side, if it's a restaurant, there's, you know, 15 to 30 jobs that are created, and that would be anywhere from, you know, back of the house type cooks and chefs to servers and bartenders, and so those jobs and salaries would vary. Um, there's also a maintenance component that would, we have a, a maintenance team, uh, there'd probably be another per full-time person dedicated to this building for maintenance, and that's probably... Fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year type of salary. So hopefully it answers. The it, it answers my question. So um, through the chair um, to the um, uh, development team here. Oh goodness! So this go. You know what? I'm y'all can't say I've solved the world's problems, but I, I just I, I, again I'm asking these questions because I just don't know what's going on in our economy, right? Right. I, I just. I just don't know what's going on in, the, in our economy. And understanding um, when we look at um, you know, the service industry, where would they actually live in the city of Cleveland? Right. Where are they gonna live? Yeah. And this is one of the things where, from my perspective, where I, 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 just, I, I just, in my mind, I just, I, it is, I'm like, where? Like, where? I, I just, I'm so confused, you know? And like I said, I know this isn't your issue, but it really is your issue, because you really, in the service industry, while there is a workforce issue of a lot of turnover, it's, I don't know what we are going to have to do as a community 
to think differently about how people are going to truly live in the city of Cleveland with the, there's just such a vast scale on job opportunities that are provided and the reality of how you can live a decent life in the city of Cleveland based on the availability of workforce opportunities. They're they're just, just too, broad of a gap and I think you know as a company you should think about where they gonna work where they gonna live Mm -hmm. because right now people they don't have any place to live and if they do they're spending 30 40 50 percent of the household income Mm -hmm. to live somewhere that they can't afford and then life happens my alternator goes out and I there, there goes my job because I can't come to work. So again, this is not your issue, but I'm just thinking about this stuff, and I'm just like, oh goodness, that. But I, I am thinking about some solutions. I will be saying that, and I will put in for right. chairman. But um, I, I know the answer to my questions regarding, um, you know, how much you all are going to profit on this project. Um, but I will uh, ask you the question because I don't know what is your philosophy on, um, you know. Inclusion of minority contractors and the like. What's just been your 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 um, your philosophy and practice thus far? If you can share that with me, and that's my yeah, last question. I, on every project that we've done, there has been a component of that. And unlike the prior applicant NRP, who is fully integrated, they have their own general contractor division. We we don't have that, so we largely defer to the general contractor on each project. To figure out the best subs and and to make sure that there's a component to that, but that's not necessarily our expertise on, on the development side. But our general contractor for this project is Independence uh, Construction, who's had a long working relationship with the city and done a lot of projects, and they are well versed in that area. And I'm fully confident that they will satisfy that without any issues. Geronimo, Geronimo family, yes. Mm, okay, so just to. Follow up with this. Sure. Yeah. And then to the McCormick asked for a point too. So okay. I'll let you finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, to the chair. And so I will say that for all of the people, and it's again, I don't know them, I don't have a relationship with them. So for everybody that's working in Cleveland, mm-hmm. in the construction factor, you look at every disparity study from the city of Cleveland to the state of Ohio, they talk about the discriminatory practices, not only from the companies, but from financial institutions. So for, and again, I know this isn't a new company. They've been here longer than 25 years, right? Probably, yep. yeah, right. Yes. So, and we, ha- and we have yet to make the mark. So again, like something is not making sense. And so for as much work as we are saying that people are doing, sometimes your, 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 best, your best is not good enough. And we really got to start thinking very differently and not thinking bif- differently. We got to do differently to get a different result. And like I said, I am a person that thinks that we do need to look at people's profits, what you are making, because it's not going back into people here in the city of Cleveland. So like I said, this ain't y'all issue. Y'all just happen to be here and I'm going to have these conversations. And I don't know what else to do outside of using my voice in real ways to think about how do we change this system so it can benefit the average Clevelander. The average Clevelander is suffering. Yeah. They suffering, you know? And I, I just like, and I don't understand like why you have to beg people to, to damn, like just do right. Help people out yeah, for that's... real. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, I know this ain't y'all, and uh, this no, is not to you. I'm, I'm talking about this system. Right. So we have opportunity to, 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 to right this ship, and I hope that people will take this message to think about how can we really be a partner with people. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman House. I'll, I'll Councilman Corman with your point, and then we'll go to Councilman Harsh. Yeah, thank you. No, I just wanted to touch on one thing that Councilwoman House said too, and I think Tremont's a really good example of this. So Tremont has a significant amount of low-income housing and a significant amount of market housing, and we have a huge gap, to the councilwoman's point, in workforce. And so I think this is a collective issue, director, chief, developers, council, that we need to really get to is that, you know, not, I don't qualify for um, the rent-controlled housing, and I can't afford market, and I'm in the middle, and a lot of our service industry fits there, right? So, I mean, and, and it's historically been a huge gap and I would say especially on the near west side because I have the second highest concentration of public housing in the city in my ward 
and I probably have some of the biggest uh, numbers of market rate housing. But what we're seeing is the folks in the middle, and that's a big group, um, and not only do I think that that's a, a moral imperative, I think it's a business opportunity to figure out how to do that. So I just, and this is a conversation we've been having with the former administration and the current administration yeah. too, but it's a really important um, uh, uh, key target group that we're not doing a good job satisfying. So I just wanted to, to oh. touch on that. Through the chair to the council member, I just want to basically, and I guess to everyone in the public, I want to just clarify, when we're talking about market rate housing, there are Market rate is very kind of, there's a general overall average market rate for the city, but there are neighborhood specific market rates. Mm. And so when you talk about market rate in Tremont, you're really talking about high end housing from, from a cost perspective, because market rate in Collinswood, market rate in Glenville, those are totally different numbers. So I guess the big challenge that we have in a city, in the, in the city is making sure that there are opportunity places and spaces for everyone. In every neighborhood, there's opportunity. And I know just on the elevator, I had a conversation with Councilwoman Santana and Councilwoman House about how do we create different ownership models and different housing structures. I mean, just to create, to, to, to basically be more inclusive and create more housing. I mean, we're doing a lot of multifamily rental in this city. We need to have more ownership models. We can do multifamily um, with cooperative um, you know, ownership models. We can do, I mean, there's different ways to address these solutions. I mean, at the end of the day, the best affordable housing solution is a living wage job. That's right. Absent of that, That's right. how do we make sure that everybody who's contributing to in this society, in this community, to the best of their ability. I don't care if they're a sweet streeper. I don't care if they're doing fries at McDonald's. I don't care. If they're contributing to the best of their ability, that they have decent housing, they have opportunity, and that they're not, and that they're not um, you know, food deprived and opportunity deprived. So that is really the charge that we have in the city, in community development, in economic development, and it's a multi-layered solution. I don't expect any one developer to solve the problem, but I do expect everybody to try to do their part. And I, that's, I guess that's kind of where Councilwoman House is on this. How are we all doing our part? I mean, I've had conversations with members of, the, of council about maybe we need to change some legislation on how our enforcement and put some teeth in our um, 187 and 188. I mean, I have projects that are $50 million and they're just at almost zero on those numbers. And they're just like, eh. I mean, they're willing to write the check because the check is nothing, I mean, relative to the effort in their minds. So how do we put tooth in some of these ordinances? How do we incentivize? How do we prioritize those developers that are, are making the effort and that are willing to make the effort? How do we basically tell developers that have historically not met those requirements that, sorry, you're not eligible for any more incentives mm -hmm. until you get right with God? Or at least get right with Cleveland. <laughs> well, I want the I want the first. Uh, I want the first. Thank you, Director, for that. And I agree with you. You and I have ha had those conversations. You know, I stand as a partner, ready to work with you. Uh, and so does this uh, uh, council uh, to add some teeth to those ordinances that we currently have. And if we need to enforce or bring about different ordinances to achieve what we want to achieve, you have my commitment <coughs> to, uh, to to bring those through. Uh, 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 Kevin wants to uh, chime in briefly and then we'll go to Councilman Harsh. Um, thank you to the chairperson, to Councilwoman House, to Nick. Just on a point that Councilwoman House said, just a question on, uh, with your Electric Gardens project on workforce housing, if you could maybe share on what you know, Nick, of people who work either in the, the, the limelight incubator there that live in the building and or that you know of um, that work in maybe some of the area restaurants or or a retailer bar uh, that live in that building, if you can maybe ad lib on maybe some of the success that you are aware of with that project to help uh, address a little bit of the question that uh, Councilman House brought up. Yeah, I think the best way to answer it is that we, um, We've focused on doing this project because of the demand that we've seen from the Electric Guards project. And a lot of the demand is in that studio um, type of product, which is, you know, Electric Gardens, it's 1100 to, you know, $1,300 a month. And there's a lot of people that are looking for 
that. And it's, you know, it is a studio, so it's, it's not like they're living in some, you know, huge one bedroom. But at the same time, people are living in, in a little bit simpler spaces these days. They have less belongings, they have less furniture, they have less things. So that studio apartment is something that is fitting for a lot of people. And that demand that we've seen is what led us to try to pursue another project. So I think there's a lot of people out there that fit in that category that are looking for a place to live that has a building with a lot of great amenities, but they're not paying $3,000 a month to live there. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Harsh. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I do have a specific question about the development, but before I, I ask it, I just want to say that um, not every project can solve every problem in the city, but I think that all of our problems are connected. And when it comes to the housing shortage in Cleveland right now, uh, developing new units is going to help create more affordable housing, regardless of what those units go on market for. The people that move in here are either going to come from a lower cost unit in the city that then becomes available, or they're going to move to the city from outside of the city and grow our population, both of which have positive economic impacts on our city. And I'd be, Mr. Chairman, before I found my forever home in, in old Brooklyn, I was a tree monster for a decade. Uh, I had the three bedroom, $350 a month downstairs of a house that is long gone. Nobody will ever get that again, and I understand. And it's news to no one in Tremont that prices are going up and that the neighborhood is developing. That will shock no one living in Tremont. I've been across this country. I've lived for months in Philadelphia, and I've, I've worked extensively in, in Chicago and, 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 and New York and, and San Francisco, and every single one of those cities has a highly developed part of town where incomes are well beyond what I will ever achieve. And, and every single city that has big success rates in this country has a part of town that is, is upper income. And Tremont, of all places, is probably the most perfectly designed for this neighborhood, Mr. Chairman. It is a triangle attached to a rectangle, and it is a very small neighborhood. It is geographically bound by a river and a highway, and you can't really bleed outside of it a whole lot. The development that we're seeing from Tremont to Ohio City, Detroit Shoreway is, is, is fairly contained. Geographically, my neighborhood has a 40,000 median income value, and it will always probably be a little bit in that range, and will be available for people forever, and I welcome you to come to Old Brooklyn if, if Tremont gets too expensive. We also have other neighborhoods throughout the city that are always going to be affordable for people um, that are very close and, and have great amenities and, and can service the needs of people that can't afford to live in Tremont. So I find the development to be a positive net for the city when we have a housing shortage, knowing that this can relieve pressure in other areas of the housing market that can then be used by other workers. I would also point out that uh, I was at an art gallery the other day downtown, Mr. Chairman. I saw a piece of art that was beautiful. It was made by a Cleveland resident who is not a high-income individual, but uh, this person needed $1,800 for this piece of art, um, and I cannot afford that. So I hope that somebody in our city can because this is a good artist that wants to sell good art, but I can't afford to pay them for, what, for the value they put into it. Um, so I hope that somebody in the city of Cleveland can buy that art from that Cleveland artist and support that type of economy because that's when we thrive, when we have that true mixed income economy, which means stuff on the high end and stuff on the low end. And, and I was in Tremont back when uh, the CMHA buildings were torn down and Hope 6 was built, and I've seen the development and the change that's happened there, and it's all been very positive. I don't think that anybody wants to go back to the 1998 Tremont. Um, so I, I consider this a good project. My specific question, Mr. Chairman, through the chair to the, to the gentleman, is this parking garage underground um, and the first floor is still residential, or is this parking garage on the first floor? I couldn't quite tell from your rendering. Okay. So there's, there's two components. There's an underground component, and then there's a surface lot to the south. So it is underground. There's, yeah, the primary parking for the building is underground. It's partially submerged, and then there's a, kind of a podium, and then there's four stories above it. In addition to that, there's about 25 surface parking okay. spaces. Okay, and, and so through the chair, so the surface parking is going to be available to people in the neighborhood. The underground parking will be for the residents? The surface lot won't be just open general public. It'll be open for um, the residents of the building and then the retail component for both employees and visitors of the retail component. For the re oh, 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 of the first floor retail, yes. we'll have the surface parking. The basement garage will be for the residents exclusively? The basement or garage, residents exclusively, the surface parking, residents, okay. and retail. Got it. OK, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman, Councilwoman Swinson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I actually had a quick point, Councilman Harsh, on what you were, I wanted to make sure I was following kind of um, what you were stating uh, in your, in your, the beginning part of your statement. Can you clarify your thinking around um, that 
high-end projects can provide relief in the housing market. I just wanted to make sure I'm following your thinking on that. A absolutely. It's a really important concept. So when a unit comes online at $2,000, the person that moves into that unit very well could be vacating a $1,500 unit elsewhere in the city. That $1,500 unit that becomes available could be occupied by somebody who's currently occupying a $1,000 unit. People typically, over time, as, they, as their income increases, move into more expensive units. When I moved out of Tremont from a $350 unit, I moved to a $700 unit, right? And then I took on a mortgage later on, which costs even more. People typically, over time, spend more and more money on housing. So if you're targeting 30s and 40s something, the, the millennials, um, that are, their <coughs> income is going up, when they move into these units, they're typically making a, a, a more affordable unit available behind them, which is going to be somewhere else in the city, we hope, or their new residents and our population goes up. Both of these are good things. I'd love to speak with you more about, about that offline. I think um, there's an interesting question about at what point do people want to move on from not renting, they want to move into other forms of housing like homeownership, but I think that's a longer conversation offline, but thank the, you. The whole housing market is connected and there's all, it's, it's, it's like a body, you don't affect it. one part, it's all, all connected. Um, through the chair to the council member, I just want to add that that model is very specific to um, what we call inelastic housing markets. And that's a market where there isn't much room and much space, and so there's not a lot of flexibility. Um, right now, because of the situation we have, we, we have a lot of blight and vacant unit, but as we put more housing into the system, I think that we're not going to be as inelastic and people aren't necessarily going to be necessarily moving, you know, freeing up units, they'll just be moving into other neighborhoods or moving into the suburbs. So, I mean, and that's, that's one of the challenges that we have here when people decide that they don't want to live downtown and they can't afford Tremont, mm -hmm. they're moving out to Cleveland Heights, University Heights, just because at some point in time, people can only pay what they can afford. So. And, and, Mr. Chair, to this point directly, this is why it's so important to promote our neighborhoods throughout the city yeah. because we have affordable neighborhoods everywhere in Cleveland. We sell houses for $180,000 in Old Brooklyn that are gorgeous, that you would spend $350,000 on in other neighborhoods, and I encourage people to look at them. Um, but we have neighborhoods throughout the city that are going to be affordable for folks, and we need to make sure that those neighborhoods are promoted because we, I think, have the stock to, 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 to keep and retain residents if they do decide that they don't want to live in the downtown. Yeah, you can stay here. You don't have to look elsewhere. Councilman McCormick. You know, I was just going to note that, and I, I think it's a very real dynamic too, but I would be very curious to see how many old Brooklyn homeowners came from Tremont and Ohio. I bet it's quite a few. Uh, Mr. Chair, to, the, to my colleague, it is quite a few, actually. We see it quite often, people that move into old Brooklyn because Tremont got a little too pricey and they were looking for more space. Typically is what we get. People wanted a backyard, a front yard, a garage, they have maybe children, that type of uh, environment. But yeah, absolutely, it happens. All right, any further questions? Any further dialogue? All right, thank you all this morning. We'll see you no further questions. Ordinance number 1039-2022 stands approved. All right, Adam, all right, Nicholas. Thank now, you I much. say this every time, and I have yet to receive my, uh, my invitation to uh, ribbon cuttings and, 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 and groundbreaking, so I'm, I'm expecting one for this project, all right? Yep. Please do not disappoint Noted. the chairman on okay. this, please. All right, all right. thank you. Yes, sir, yeah. All right, and, and, I think, and, I, and I think we're, we're scheduled, we're, we're supposed to go see Electric Gardens, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Love Thank to you. have you. Thank you. All right. Uh, take care. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council. All right. Uh, Director Hernandez, come on up. Uh, uh, Assistant Director Wackers. Eight nine eight or eight nine nine. Eight nine nine is going to be fair. Eight nine eight is acquisition and rebound. You're eight nine nine, right? Okay. Uh, um, Kimberly, 899, do we have the uh, presentation for this? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Director, Assistant Director, uh, for, for being here this morning. I know there's been some back and forth on both of these pieces uh, here. And we have um, 
uh, reluctantly have found ourselves all here this morning uh, to hear 899 and 898, uh, just to be quite frank, all right? And so, uh, just to the committee, uh, I wanted to make that statement so that way you understand, uh, you understand the position we are um, uh, uh, interacting here uh, this morning, all right? Uh, this is, the way I'm viewing these two pieces here this morning is that we are uh, going to hear some preliminaries from uh, both departments about 898 and 899. Uh, there will be some amendments that will be shared this morning as I've shared with uh, uh, the directors here and they, some of them are already aware of some of those amendments. This, is, this will allow for the departments to begin their process to uh, put together uh, additional framework outside of what, we all, we will, what we've already discussed and allow them to get moving um, through the process. Again, they will have to come back to the committee uh, uh, before they enter into a contract once the RFP is, uh, is issued. So, you know, there is time in between now and that point uh, to address any other uh, questions uh, or concerns that arises. All right. This again, I view this as allowing the department, uh, and I'm sure they view this as well, just allowing uh, them to begin the process to uh, start drafting the framework and begin to uh, uh, seek their partners to help them administer these funds. In my own point, uh, directors. We okay. are happy to continue. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, turn it over to you, Director. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you to the committee. Um, we are uh, excited to continue this conversation that's been happening this morning about housing. Um, when I have come to this board, uh, to, to this council in the past, um, I have talked about um, different tools in the toolbox and how we're going to have to have e a multi-prong approach to addressing uh, housing in the city of Cleveland. Um, we are doing that uh, here today with um, this first item, which is home repair. So for home repair, um, I, I, I do want to note that this is for $10 million and not $15. Um, so this is $10 million um, under ARPA. So we want to talk about all of our programs uh, are being viewed through the lens of the 10-year um, housing plan. Right, and so um, Mikhail will walk us through some of those items of the 10-year housing plan, um, some of those targets, right? What are our goals through the 10-year housing plan? Um, and uh, we will talk about how uh, this program specifically will address uh, those goals directly. So I will turn it over to Mikhail to talk through that 10-year um, housing plan process and how home repair fits into it. Thank you, uh, Director, and um, to the chair and to the, the members of the committee. Uh, the Cleveland Housing Plan 2030 uh, set out a goal of uh, 100,000 homes to be touched through various efforts uh, over the next decade. Um, a, um, the biggest need really falls into the need to preserve our housing stock. Um, uh, over 40,000 units need to be sort of addressed uh, through a variety of code enforcement, but also home repair um, and other type of programs to really preserve our existing housing stock and to prevent that housing stock from deteriorating and becoming a, not just a blight issue, but also a cost issue um, uh, in, in the fact that it would need to be demolished if it was beyond uh, rescue. Um, as everyone knows, city's uh, housing stock is, is um, very old. Over 80% is actually before 1940. 90% of the housing stock in the city of Cleveland um, is from prior to 1978. Um, and as a result of that aging housing stock without adequate investment, um, it's, uh, it's potentially a liability, but uh, honestly, it it's, it's really is an opportunity um, uh, for the city of Cleveland. Um, this map is, uh, sorry, is not uh, uh, a surprise to any of you, um, but the the last sort of um, citywide uh, survey of housing stock, and hopefully new data will shine new light onto this situation. Um, but the prevalence of D and F graded structures throughout the city um, is is shown uh, on this map uh, with obviously greater concentrations of those uh, poor conditioned structures on the east side. 
um, but there is, uh, they are scattered throughout the whole, the, the entire city, as you can see by those sort of black dots um, where structures actually are located. Uh, the next slide, in order to address that, we have set up uh, a goal, overarching goal within the plan, as well as a number of strategies. Um, we need to invest in our, the quality of our existing homes, and that requires us to implement uh, a comprehensive emergency home repair program and to provide access to private financing for home repair. And I'll hand it back over to the director. Thank you so much, Assistant Director Wackers. Um, so again, this, uh, this ordinance is, is for a $10 million ARPA. Um, our estimated units, uh, we will be looking at 800 houses. Um, and we'll do this through a multitude of ways, through loans, through grants, and through loan loss uh, reserves. Um, we intend to uh, make these dollars go further by leveraging the private sector. Um, and uh, as with all of our ARPA, um, this will be uh, expended by the 2026 deadline. So what does it actually look like? Um, so for this program, as, as you all uh, well know, um, the city does have some direct, uh, through HUD, has some direct home repair uh, that, that, we, um, that we manage through the Department of Community Development. Um, that is not what we are talking about today. So you'll see that top line there for our existing, um, our existing city administered program um, that, that we're not um, seeking to put additional funds towards that. Um, this will be a complement to those programs that are already uh, funded by HUD. Um, what we're instead looking to do uh, are to have home repair grants um, and home repair lending uh, through partners. And those partners would be nonprofits, CDFIs, um, and financial institutions. Again, this represents a two-prong approach, one where we are um, uh, meeting the needs of the community where they're at, um, whether that is through, uh, you know, 100% uh, through grants, or whether that is through, um, through lending. Uh, and then for program delivery, um, again, um, as, as we have brought to you before uh, from this department, uh, when it comes with ARPA, we want to be wildly successful. Um, and we know that we have to have personnel to be able to do that. And so that bottom line there for program delivery um, is to help support. Uh, while we won't be managing the program directly, we still have to ensure that we have personnel that deal with compliance, accountability, and reporting um, throughout that process and making sure that um, uh, we are being timely on uh, payments that go out. Um, so the next step for this program would be um, to put out RFPs, as the, uh, as the chairman mentioned, um, to garner those partnerships um, and really design based on, um, on that. Um, so again, some, some key things that we um, want to address here, uh, we're looking for both grants and lending, right? Um, so that's pushing the, the private sector financial institutions to investing more into our communities. Um, and, and, and we'll need the, the staff to go ahead and push the needle on, on that. Um, additionally, um, I know this question gets asked often, you know, what does, you know, what does the AMI look like? Who are we talking about? So for this program, we are um, looking at a 300% AMI. And so that looks like um, 82,000, Nope, nope, 83,250 for a family of four. So that's that number and below. 83,250 for a family of four and below. That is who we're looking to address uh, through these home repair programs. Um, I again want to mention uh, through our housing plan, and, and you all know it as well, I know we've had conversations individually, um, that home repair is absolutely important. Um, and for housing, when we talk about tool, uh, different tools in our toolkit, um, this one has been one of the most important ones 
that we can put forward. We need both what you were hearing in the first two items, uh, which are you know those new market rate multifamily. We love that, that's good, but we also need to make sure that we're supporting those who currently live, have been living, uh, and want to maintain their homes in the city of Cleveland. Um, and, and we are excited to do that. Um, another point with the financial institutions, we want this to be a down payment into home repair. We don't want it to stop when the, when the ARPA funds stop. So again, using this and leveraging for an evergreen fund um, so that we can continue and spark home repair through our financial institutions, um, you know, pushing, uh, you, again, we talk about the, the, the policy pushes and pulls, pushing and pulling those financial institutions to do lending in the communities where we need them to lend, um, showing that, uh, you know, where they, they uh, may believe is too risky, um, we are going to help cover some of that risk so that we can push them into areas um, that have been, quite frankly, neglected by our financial institutions. Um, with that, I will ask uh, Director, Assistant Director Wackers um, if he has anything additional to add, and, and then uh, otherwise we'll be happy to um, answer questions from, from the panel today. I think you covered it well, pretty well. Turn it back over to you, Chair. <laughs> you should wait until you're cute. <laughs> All right. Thank you, uh, Director. Thank you, Assistant Director. Um, Director Mars, anything you want to add to this as well or no? Um, Mr. Chairman, I would just say it's sorely needed. It was needed a year ago. It was needed this week. You know, we, we certainly are excited to get this moving, and we look forward to council support. Sure. Thank you. Um, before we uh, move on, there's a few questions that I do have uh, for uh, community development. And uh, first, you know, just reading, just looking through uh, the ordinance and under section one, there's a number of things that have jumped out um, uh, to us here on council that we are, we have questions about. So, you know, the first is, you talked about ARPA eligible home repair cost. Uh, can you all define ARPA eligible home repair cost? What does that mean? So ARPA, and again, you know, this is a response to the pandemic, um, first and foremost. Uh, ARPA wants this to be targeted to those, uh, either the, the direct, direct impacts of the uh, pandemic or to support people who would generally be left out of the recovery. Um, there's a couple ways that we, it's not so much the, the cost of the particular home repair, but where and who we're serving. Um, to make, simplify, U.S. Treasury has sort of um, put you, allow you to do this sort of in two buckets. Uh, populations that are traditionally disenfranchised uh, or areas which are traditionally see less investment compared to other areas. Um, U.S. Treasury has a map called Qualified Census Tracts, which covers most of the city. Uh, there's a couple odd donut holes here and there. Um, uh, but probably 90% of the city would qualify for these type of home repair um, investments. Uh, and then if there are uh, sort of households uh, that sort of would fall into one of those areas that are not qualified by U.S. Treasury's map, then we could probably qualify them based on uh, other factors um, such as household makeup, uh, race, ethnicity, uh, income, uh, if they're below the poverty line or, or um, so that is what we're talking about. What is uh, ARPA eligible? Sure. Thank you, Assistant Director. Also, um, in that same section, you talked about backstop loans. Can you further explain? Yes. Yeah, so um, I think this is, you know, I, I'm probably putting words in the law department's mouth, but um, we had asked to, to get authority to, to work with financial institutions to uh, use this funding to as a, um, a loan loss reserve, uh, and I think this is a term that they uh, opted to <laughs> insert into legislation um, that would function as a loan loss reserve. Loan loss reserves are when we uh, help alleviate some of the risks that a financial institution might take on um, in order to lend in a space that they traditionally find to be more risky. Mm -hmm. um, more often than not, it's not that it's risky, it's just that the risk is unknown. 
uh, us being able to put a, together a pool of funds that could give them some reassurance uh, that if it is uh, found to be uh, in fact risky, uh, then they have some cover uh, that they can fall back on. Um, but as we have seen uh, co continuously, when we, we provide these loan loss reserves, they're seldomly used um, beyond sort of unique situations. Um, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, Cleveland and, and, and its residents are, tend to be, um, you know, I find them to be a good uh, investment, um, whereas they're just traditionally not given those opportunities uh, due to the historical issues such as redlining throughout the uh, city of Cleveland. Thank you, uh, Assistant Director. Uh, just continuing on the line of question in Section 1, so all of these are pertaining to Section 1. Um, uh, you define, you mentioned the word, um, certain landlords, what does that mean? Can you define that? Again, I think what um, the law department is doing here is trying to narrow the scope of what, how these ARPA funds can use, be used, because we are looking at using the restrictive ARPA funds. A lot of other initiatives you've been uh, seeing has been um, the re revenue recovery to provide greater flexibility, which essentially is functions as general fund dollars. This request is to use the restricted ARPA dollars, therefore we need to make sure that um, uh, whatever program is implemented, that it is, you know, ARPA eligible and that the tenants or the house homeowners are eligible based on ARPA criteria. Um, and this is just, an, you know, another way to limit the authorization in the legislation to those particular restrictions. Okay. Additionally, to the chairman, um, these financial institutions, um, I want to bring your attention to the 50 million that we are, um, uh, th that, that is our goal for leveraging those dollars. So when we seek partnerships, we want them to also come to the table with funds. And that is why I described it as a bit of a down payment. So there's the ARPA dollars that, that do have those restrictions. But when we seek partners, we're seeking partners that are bringing their additional dollars that may not have those restrictions. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Assistant Director. I think uh, between now and when this is uh, up for the to, for finance that we need to further kind of define certain landlords and make that clear and spell it out, you know, what, what exactly we are talking about. So there's no gray area uh, for understanding around certain landlords, all right? And so that is something we can, a document we can attach as a file to this or whether we add this to the ordinance. So that is something that can be done after the fact. We won't try to get that done today, all right? Uh, also, at 65% uh, EMI, uh, what is that estimated uh, pool that you all believe uh, this, will, um, uh, this will turn out to be? Assistant Director. It's, uh, this way. All in section one. Um, yeah, 65 uh, AMI uh, is household income that generally falls between uh, 40 and $45,000. Uh, for family size. For, and it also is adjusted based on family size. So. Okay, so 40 to 45K, and it's adjusted based on family size. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Um, what also mentioned by restricted uh, covenants. What, can you further elaborate? Uh, generally, um, those, that's giving us authorization if we're entering into loans, especially with landlords. Um, you know, we, well, we like to see home repair, but if it's, a, it's, a, it's an affordable unit, it's being sold, rented for maybe $400 a month, um, and we invest in it, we don't want to, we want to make sure that they don't you know, jack up the rent to $800 a month and then evict the, the, the household that, that lives there. So we, whenever we, we tend to f expect some term of benefit, uh, often five years, um, that you're not, you know, that whoever is of a certain income would continue to benefit from whatever investment we, we put into that property uh, and not be re uh, displaced as a result of, of the city's investment. Sure, thank you, because that's important. Because what you don't want to do is that you incentivize and then, you know, mm -hmm. you support it, and now they think they can get even more money. Yeah. So I uh, appreciate that uh, response. Also, uh, there is, there was mention around um, uh, rental forgiveness, and what happens if a 
do we disqualify uh, a landlord if they refuse to participate in rental forgiveness, or what does that look like? Um, are, you, are you referencing uh, a particular section, Chair? All in Section 1. Section, okay. Um, yeah, that moves to Section 2, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a, a second to look at it. Um, Or you can just uh, yeah, comment I'll, on whether. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not. Um, so again, I think what we're trying to do is, is un recognize all the components of, of uh, ARPA funded <coughs> initiatives. One, you know, a significant program that we've been operating for the last uh, year and a half, two years, is our, our emergency rental assistance program. Sure. Um, landlords who would look to participate in, in this sort of home repair program, we would expect them to also be. Um, uh, re, uh, available to participate in the rental restriction, um, rental emergency rental assistance program. Again, and we're trying to tie the various ARPA-related investments together, and not be yeah, not allow landlords to be self-selective. So that's re so. Thank you for that. That is referring to uh, the rental assistance program, mm -hmm. not a forgiveness. Um, well, I guess it's forgiveness. So, you know, I, I get I get what the um, what the intent was, but this is, you're referencing again, the rental assistance help that they are willing to participate in and uh, accept uh, those dollars, right? Um, yeah, I'm, I still need to go through the section, but ten, mm -hmm. typically that's how I would respond, so. Sure, and, and we will not allow or disqualify whatever term we want to use to participate if that is not, um, if they do not agree to that. Uh, to the chair, I think it would be um, under unique circumstances that we would allow them to to not participate in either program. Sure. So. Okay. So part of it, um, through the chair, uh, part of it is we are talking about specifics of something that hasn't been built out yet due to that RFP and due to those partners. Right? And so that's where we really look forward to working with council to talk about what are the specifics and getting the right partners at the table so that we can structure the program to get what we need out of it. Sure. Thank you, Director. Uh, appreciate that. And again, I think that's one also that we need to, as we move along, we, we, can, we can further flush that out. Uh, as we move as we move along, which again won't happen today, because again today is is, is really allowing us to um, to ask some questions, move this through, uh, that will then revert back to you for you to, be, to continue your um, development of your framework, which I know that you were in process of doing, um, and uh, then we come back once we are ready for uh, to uh, sit down and discuss who are the RFP partner will be. Uh, just a few more. Um, um, <clears throat> Also, can you can you all further explain if if you if there are some thoughts around this? What are the allowed home repair projects? What what would be allowed under um, the home repair? Do you want to talk about what we typically do? Yeah, generally, um, yeah, we frequently see um, similar type of needs throughout the city. Uh, they they tend to be largely uh, roof and exterior needs um, uh, related to the condition of the property. On the interior, uh, we typically see, um, you know, plumbing or electrical that has become out of date that needs to be redone um, in order to be, you know, just to make a, a sanitable, sanitized and safe uh, living unit. Um, we also we see a lot of porch um, porches that need to be rebuilt um, after sure. you know a hundred years of <laughs> weathering Cleveland winters. Um, but those are probably the five sort of main areas that we typically see. So the, the roof, uh, the exterior, uh, uh, porches, um, and then electrical and plumbing. Um, we do also a lot of sidewalk and driveway um, repairs as well. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, as we move along, I think we need to kind of uh, think through it. So you mentioned generally those are the type of uh, repairs that are allowed. Um, in it, 
and you know some of the projects you know you can only do one major repair or sometimes one and a half two depending on you know the condition and the funding source etc so i think as we move along we, we need to further uh, define whether this is one project is it two projects is it you know hey we're going to cap the amount of, uh, at each property at at, at forty thousand dollars or fifty thousand uh, dollars or twenty five thousand or whatever that cap is if there's going to be a cap mm -hmm. and if so we can do whatever allows us to be done under that uh, particular dollar amount. So put that on your mental. So as we go through this, then you, we can further uh, uh, talk to those. Can, can you all define what a small landlord is? This is. Um, I don't know the number off the top of my head. Is it? I think, do, do you have a? There's a number of programs that we do run where we've defined a landlord as being small. And I thought it was 10 or fewer units owned, but it, it's, it's single digits it's probably. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's focused on um, making sure that the folks who are landlords who often live here in the, in the region, um, what we're not trying to do is uh, help supplement folks who are those private investors, um, those out-of-town investors that we um, have heard a, a lot about. Um, you know, we're, we're not interested in, uh, in, in, in helping them, right? We're focused on the, those who are smaller. They, you know, it may be uh, an up and down and, and they're living in one of them or they may have taken over, um, you know, a house down, down the block from them. So those are the, your smaller uh, landlords, your, your mom and pops as we, as we refer to them. Okay, well, which was on my list as well. So I, I had Bob and Pops on there uh, also. So okay, well, good. And so you know, you all, you have that defined. And so again, add that to your list of, of further um, uh, things that we need to define, and we need to make sure we spell out uh, that's a part of this. Um, that's a part of this ordinance. Um, Will these small landlords also be required to register with the city and the state um, uh, as well? Are these, because you know, these could be businesses for individuals. However, so do there be requirement to be registered uh, with the city and the state? Um, uh, inspection requirements, uh, lack of violations, you know, land certificates. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, through the chair, yes. So we will use this. Uh, this program um, as a way to also make sure that anybody who gets incentives that they're following that they're following along with all of the rest of the the, the host of things that we have going on, including rental registration um, and and any other incentives. Um, this is not again to subsidize uh, those who have been bad actors um, or um, you know for those who have had the means to take care of their properties um, and have uh, chosen not to. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, and, and we just, I think that we need to make that clear. We need to make sure that is listed in, in the piece, uh, that that is required, so that way there's no misunderstanding. Oh, I thought I had to do this, but didn't have to do that. Oh, I didn't think I needed to do this, but mm, I, maybe I should have done that. So we need to just clean that up, mm -hmm. so that way, you know, that is more uh, detailed and defined uh, within the piece. Um, um, also in section one, it talks about uh, technical assistance and reporting logistics. Uh, what, is, what does that mean? What, what, what are you all um, yeah. uh, talking about there? Through the chair, when we are dealing with these federal dollars, um, they often come with compliance requirements. Um, and so I spoke to that a touch when we talked about program delivery and administration and those funds for uh, making sure that we have, uh, you know, adequate reporting, that we're, um, you know, being timely in, in all of our exchanges. And so this is um, making sure that we are uh, keeping the folks that we partner with accountable to what they said that they would do um, per our contracting. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's simple enough. Uh, section two. We're out of section one now. So section two, just a few points, not as many as uh, section one. Uh, no, section one is always that, that, uh, that start off. Uh, flexible loans. Uh, what, can you all describe to me, uh, the committee and those who are listening, what are the requirements uh, to be considered a flexible loan? And have you all defined what that is? Uh, or are you waiting till you uh, find a partner so you can determine what that looks like? So uh, to the chair, um, so this is where we want to work with uh, our financial institutions or CDFIs when they create a pool to, to do lending. We want to ensure that they're one, their underwriting standards are 
um, allow for them to consider the, the unique circumstances of the, either the landlord or the property owner, um, not doing traditional underwriting, um, but uh, being more flexible uh, so that if they are, you know, if they have a history of, of making payments um, uh, on, on other like utilities or other aspects that we will entertain that as opposed to a, a credit score um, as, as being the only marker of, of them being a good uh, investment. Um, we also want to make sure that the, the terms of the loan are affordable, um, you know, that when there are instances where a you know, a prime rate might be unaffordable to a homeowner that we would try and uh, get them to also uh, offer below prime uh, lending rates. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, this is city money and if we're taking on the risk where the financial institution is um, lending their money and, and but the risk is falls in the city of Cleveland, we wanna make sure that they um, provide lending products that really move the needle in terms of uh, neighborhoods that need this type of investment. I, I do want to also comment, um, Chair, that um, technical assistance here is also for, and I know we have had this conversation before, um, making sure that um, that those who are uh, who are renters, if they're they're moving into a house, that they that they are supported, sure. right? Making sure that um, all of our kind of maintenance agreements that that they don't fall into disrepair, right? And so again, wrapping around support um, both through the the technical assistance, the knowledge base, um, and also the financial um, assistance that's required sure. for success. Uh, thank you. And I and just jump ahead a little bit, uh, then we'll come back to Section 2. So, no, Section 4 talked about, you know, select the financial institutions where, uh, you, you, you know, you decide who you're going to work with in the funds. And so, you know, just listen to your response here that we have, you all have not, you haven't got to that point yet to determine what that, <laughs> he's shaking his head, right? right, right. You haven't got to that point. So, I, I, you know, that's something that we need to, as we move along, I don't uh, anticipate us having that flushed out again today, that, 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 that is something that should be considered when um, we're, we're look, determining who our partner is going to be and who and what kind of products they're going to offer uh, to really help move the needle, all right? Uh, grant, grant recipient requirements and limits. Uh, what is the thought on, on grant recipients, the requirements and the limits? Ha, have you all uh, baked that um, uh, yet or, or, or where you are on that? No, that is something that we would, we would want to work with um, with council and as, as we continue to uh, refine what the program goals are between council and our partners. Okay. Got it. Um. And, 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 and we also wouldn't want to really put that in, uh, in an ordinance and kind of uh, handcuff us. Um, we want to have as much flexibility as we possibly can so that we can uh, offer it to the widest amount of partners mm -hmm. sure. while still accomplishing the goals. Get it. You know, some of these should be in order. Some of these can be attachment and some, some can be, you know, uh, understood uh, differently. Uh, but it's good to, for us to have an understanding, you know, kind of what, what the thinking is and the kind of direction uh, that the department is headed. So that way this council is, uh, is fully aware, you know, as, as we said previously, and I've been saying this all along uh, since our first time hearing this in caucus with the president, that, you know, I, I council, I intend for council to be a part of this from, you know, from, the, from step one to step 10. And, you know, having us in part of the uh, uh, process, you know, as you work to, you know, create these guidelines and requirements um, that we actually, that we make that happen, mm -hmm. all right? Um, so that's it for me for 899. Um, I'm sure the committee has questions as well. I'll open up the committee uh, for questions. Councilman Harsh. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have a couple of questions. You got to some of them. Going back to the 65% AMI through the chair to the director, 65% AMI, you said, is 40 to 45,000 for household income. Is that, is that what you said? And so how is that? Um, if the unit has a limited maximum income of 65% AMI, are, are we looking for landlords that have um, income restrictions on their units? I'm in section one, second paragraph, 
set line seven or something. Line 10. Um, so I think, uh, I think a law department is also trying here to, to enter uh, the requirements that are currently in the ARPA legislation as who can, um, who can be served. Uh, at this point in time, and I'm happy to clarify when we get more details, um, as I understand it, there's more flexibility with the ARPA money and the restrictions. It can either be location-based, income-based, um, or disproportional population-based type of aspects. Um, but again, I think the, uh, the law department wanted to make sure that some, some of the, uh, I guess, the box by which we have to work within, um, that, that is clear in the ordinance. Um, but I'll be happy to get uh, more clarification yeah, I, on that. Mr. Chair, I, I think it's going to be very confusing because you're saying that the, the unit has a limited maximum income. And I don't know how a unit has a maximum. I don't know of any landlords that have maximum incomes for their tenants or limited maximum incomes for their tenants. Um, so I'm not sure how a unit would have a limited maximum income. I think that just needs to be clarified. I understand that we're, we're targeting. I understand that the intention, though. I do understand the intention. But I think that the language is a little bit confusing here. Um, also, section three that follows on that same line, I believe this is a, 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 a choice. Landlords who can constitute small business who have experienced financial hardship because of COVID-19. And uh, I think usually, Mr. Chairman, when you go into a room and ask who's experienced financial hardship by COVID-19, 100% of the room puts their hand up. So I don't know if this, does this now qualify every landlord through the chair to the director? director. Um, so this is one of the options that we can qualify people and, and um, we have to ensure that we can document what that looks like and if we can document it then they would qualify under this requirement it, that's this is a requirement that's sort of threaded all throughout the American Rescue Plan Act mm -hmm. and um, again uh, US Treasury has tried to simplify it they've they've determined that um, so a minority landlords would probably qualify as um, having experienced a hardship from COVID-19, but also uh, they recognize that minority landlords probably also would disproportionately not uh, benefit from the recovery and therefore are entitled to assistance under the American Recovery Act. Um, furthermore, uh, if they are located within a qualified census tract as identified by the U.S. Treasury, um, they would, I, they, in their uh, sort of rationale, those are the areas of the country which would not benefit, which will not recover and have also suffered more significantly uh, as a result of the pandemic. Um, so at the end of the day, as we craft who is eligible and who is not, um, I think we will be able to serve uh, many people, many landlords and many residents in Cleveland um, just by the nature of how U.S. Treasury is defined um, and try to make it simplify uh, okay. those qualifications. Okay. Um, in section two, and then I have just a, a few more sections, um, which uh, section two, the second paragraph, the selection of the consultant or consultants for the services shall be made by the board of control. Um, through the chair, could you please tell me the board of control is? Sure. Um, uh, to the councilman, through the chair, uh, board of controls, um, is a group that is made up of primarily directors um, from across the department as well as the mayor. Um, so board of controls um, uh, deal with all the RFP, um, uh, everything that we, uh, that we get through RFP goes through that process. There's also another committee, um, CRC, CRC committee. Um, I'm sorry, through the chair, through the director, is the Board of Controls a, a, a defined group of people that have titles that you can just tell me those titles? It's the, it's the director of this, the director of that, the director of this, yes. the director of that. Through the chair to the councilman. Um, it's the process by which the city enters into RFPs. It starts with going to a CRC committee, which is in the finance department, and then finally ratifying, once there's an ordinance in place, the contract with the Board of Control, which is chaired by the mayor, and then is made up of about 15 or 20 city directors. It's just okay. part, part of the city's 
contracting okay. process. And, and, and through the chair, they're all on the administration side of the building. Through yes. the chair, yes. This Got is it. an administration process. Okay. Um, next question then is um, moving into section uh, seven. Um, and the second line, gap. Uh, the Director of Community Development is authorized to apply for and accept any gift or grant for the gap financing housing project from any public or private entity. Is this, uh, through the chair, is this uh, in, in, in reference to the um, matching funds that you're hoping to gain for the project? I'm not, I'm not sure. When I see gap financing, I typically think about construction, not repair. So I, I'm curious what, what, what is meant by Section 7. Uh, what is gap financing and home repair? Are we are we concerned about the, the repair costs exceeding the value of the house, or I mean, what yeah. are we? Uh, through the chair, um, I, I am wondering if that is a typo in the ordinance um, from from language from the gap financing um, legislation. Yeah, the the intent for uh, at least from the department, we're not looking to do gap financing. For home repair, sure. Council, as a point, just yes. So, the thank you to the chair, to the director. I guess in listening to this and you just bringing it up, not the traditional, you know, gap gap, gap financing housing um, project program or whatever. But we have many houses where that's why they can't get financing because the amount of repairs, even 40,000 repairs are in excess of what they have our houses, specifically on the east side, and you name the wards, where you cannot get finance. And so again, I guess this is just a question. Would, it, would the availability of home repairs be able to be done in those cases where many of our homes, the amount of the work will be well, it'll bring it up to, you know, whatever, the market. Do you understand my question? Yes. I'm it, sorry. It, uh, th uh, yeah. Through the chair. Your, um, I know that's it, not it, what this it's is. Very, it yeah, it's very expensive to repair homes, right? And our homes are larger. We have talked about that uh, it, through a number of items that, that we've uh, brought forward lately. Um, this home repair will give us the, the greatest flexibility to address those homes. Um, and again, through our partners, when we're looking for financing, um, we are trying to take what is the typical process, what makes those financial institutions comfortable, and push them into a place to say, um, uh, if we uh, help support this and, and we're able to put some dollars towards this to make you feel more comfortable to make those decisions that you typically would not have made otherwise. Mm -hmm. That's the pushes and pulls that we're trying to do with the financial institutions through this. Um, because again, it can't be um, all direct, right? We've got, we've got our HUD programs, we do home repair, um, and, and then we, we have this through kind of doing those emergency home repairs, um, actually doing that work. But it, what it really is is we need to um, work on that financing piece. And so the common thread that you'll find throughout um, most of our ARPA pieces uh, related to community development is that we are pushing the financial institutions um, to uh, do more than they have typically uh, done. Absolutely. Uh Sure, it's a fair, very fair question. Sometimes people's equity in their homes doesn't uh, equal the amount that they would need to borrow to make home repairs, and they can be turned down by banks because of that, because they don't have the actual value in the house itself that's needed to fix the house. Um, so it's a very fair point. Um, I, I, I'm still not quite sure, though, that Section 7 is worded in a way that's actually serving this piece of legislation. I, I think that that might just be um, a, 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 an English uh, a, a writing problem. But my big question here gets down to section 11. Um, so through the chair um, to the director, it's been a long goal for a while to partner with uh, third party institutions to help uh, deliver and administer um, ARPA funds for home repair um, and broadly seen as a way to sort of sidestep some of the bureaucratic red tape and um, uh, bottlenecks in, in city hall that have prevented some programs from working more efficiently. My question about section 11 though, um, the grant or loan over 50000 entered under this ordinance uh, through the chair to the director. Does that refer specifically to the partner 
um, that receives the funds, or does that refer to the subrecipients that will then apply to the funds to that partner? This is, uh, through the chair, this is language that has been added on per council, if, if I am not mistaken, and so this may be a uh, question better served for council. C Councilman, can you illuminate, well, Ms. illuminate I'm, that, Chair? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, the Section 11 is pretty standard in most of our legislation. We see this in almost every single piece. I'm, 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 I'm asking through the chair to the director, is it the intention of the department, of your department, that once the funds are distributed to a third party partner, that they will then make loans indiscriminate to oversight? So, uh, through the chair, as our understanding, as we've been advised by the Department of Law, that um, the, since this is an ordinance requirement, any contract we enter into with a subrecipient, uh, they are required to adhere by these requirements as well. So in theory, if there's an intention of the committee that you, if they make a loan over 50,000 or give a grant of over 50,000, um, they would need, we would have to get legislation in order to authorize that. I mean, I, what? Okay. So, so Mr. Mr. Chair, this gets into a very, very complicated area that I feel like we haven't really fleshed out. Mm -hmm. Taxpayers deserve oversight and ARPA money needs to be spent in a way that is responsible and that people are know what is happening with this money. And, and I do have concerns, Mr. Chair, about large amounts of money going out to third party who then lends without oversight. So I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about no, not saying. having proper so, oversight and thus being able to. So, so, uh, so because the ordinance has section 11 in it, uh, any, any contract, grant, or loan given by the city of Cleveland or by any subrecipient that we give a pool of money to would need to come back for legislative authority if that, if what they give out in a contract or land, grant or loan is over $50,000. So if we give, say, uh, a million dollar contract to nonprofit A, and nonprofit A gives a $65,000 grant to a homeowner, then we would have to come back and get an ordinance in order to be able to give that $65,000 grant. Okay. I'm sorry, can I have a point? Thank you, uh, Assistant Director. Uh, Councilman Hart, would you allow a point from Councilman yes. House? Yeah. Okay, so uh, to the Chair, to the Director. Y'all, this is one of the things I think we really have to talk about, because I, I, I don't know, I mean, just the time it takes to do stuff, and I understand, okay. It's just to me, I, I just find that this can be hindering our ability to work in the best interest of people, right? Especially when it comes to getting a house. And I, I just, I think we really need to think through what is oversight look like? How do you make investments? And how do you have responsible people, right? Because again, when you give a contract that might be you know, on the on the construction side, we allocate, and I don't know, if, yeah, you allocate the money and they do what they do with their subcontracts, but then you have to have maybe like a reporting thing, but to ask for people to come back for all this money, I, I just, do we have a track, uh, the, a good analysis of the time it takes to get through the processes? Because again, we hear so much about how long it takes to get through the city of Cleveland's processes. If we are getting through, or this goal is for this project to do hundreds or a hundred, how are we going to do this? How much time does it take? What, what are the, even from council side, and I think this is the analysis that I guess, this is a request in the question. Is it possible to give the costs and how much does it actually cost us to go through these processes of the $50,000 contract if we're doing it twice? Because this is the process If we say we have an RFP to company A, then company A does their process and then they have to come back again to, do, to, to get a check. I just need to know how much time is this 
taking and how much does it actually cost? And I'm talking about from city council time, from the law department time, from the community development department, time, from the economic development, time. how much does this actually cost? And if it costs more than $50,000, like, like what is the cost? Does anybody know that cost to do this? Well, I, through the chair, I believe that we're allocating 75000 for the program delivery. Yeah. But again, just because it's, there are caps on what you can actually charge yourself, right? Just because that's the cap on the administration fee, that does not mean that is the real actual cost. We can, uh, we can ask uh, for, for further clarification on, on that. You know, we, we hear your point. Uh, yeah, hold on one second. Um, thank you, Councilwoman House. Councilwoman Harsh, would you allow a point from yes. Councilwoman Spencer? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just on this, on this line of conversation, um, is it a false, I mean, so the spirit of this is eight, to get to 800 units with the 10 million. Um, so that's an average of 12,500 per unit. So it would be very unusual. I don't think it is the spirit or the intention of this, um, these funds to fund projects at more than 50,000. That, that would be highly unusual. Is that is that, am I understanding the spirit of this, uh, this legislation correctly? That, that would be a highly, that, that would not be common, it would not be common to have to come back for legislative authority um, because of the amount of units we're trying to get to. Just wanting to clarify the, the general spirit or thinking around the- um, I guess I would ask, why wouldn't it be? Why wouldn't it be? Why wouldn't it be the spirit to have them come back? Um, to have the subrecipient come back, it would be very unusual for a subrecipient to be making a grant or loan greater than fifty thousand dollars to an individual landlord or owner occupant. Based on, I'm just okay. I hope I haven't confused myself even more. Um, it was eight hundred units at ten million dollars, and I did I do that wrong? That math. Does anyone? Am I totally making it more confusing? I'm Ms. sorry, Mr. <laughs> Chair. It's okay. Ms. Ms. So Chair, if, if I may. all I'm saying is that um, is that we don't expect we wouldn't expect most loans or grants to exceed fifty thousand dollars. Is I'm is all I'm saying. Cor correct, Mr. Chair. If I may directly to this point. So the uh, ten million divided by eight hundred is twelve thousand five hundred. So if we're trying to do eight hundred units with ten million dollars, we're looking at twelve thousand five hundred dollars per unit, and that is roughly the cost of a roof or a, a, a necessary repair inside of a house. And Mr. Chair, I, I think we understand the spirit of this is to get the money out efficiently. I guess the concern though is, Mr. Chair, what would happen if a subrecipient A was in Shaker Square and all their loans went to Shaker Square, subrecipient B was in Asia Town and all their loans went to Asia Town, and subrecipient C was in West Town, West Park, and all their loans went to West Park, and we didn't find out till the $10 million was spent. Right. I guess the concern I have, Mr. Chair, is how do we over how do we have oversight knowing that these grants and these monies are being fairly distributed throughout the city on a need basis, efficiently and effectively, if once the money has gone to the third party, we no longer have any oversight. That's my concern, Mr. Chair. And I agree with you, Councilman uh, Harsh. Um, we're going to go to one last point and from Councilwoman House, and we're going to um, let Councilwoman Harsh continue, then we're going to move on to the, whoever's next on the list. Just the point of it. So, but it's a part of this legislation to the chair, to the director. Isn't it a part of being in a qualified census, like qualified census track? Uh, right th through the church, most most of the, most of the city is going right. to be. And then a part that. of the things I understand this whole twelve thousand five hundred. Oh, it's for a roof. But for most people, if you have looked in places where you have DNF rated structures, it, it is in excess of like fifty thousand dollars to repair these homes. And I like I said, and I know I'm coming from a place of like Ward Seven. It costs about fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars to repair these homes. So this whole thing of, and that's what I'm saying is like, and like I said, I think if people don't understand, like twelve thousand five hundred dollars not doing nothing to repair no homes in Glenville, in Huff, in Central, in Mount Pleasant, it's not doing anything. So like, and I understand it's like the leveraging of funds that should be coming from the private sector to get to where it needs. And when you talk about the fifty to sixty-five thousand dollars to repair a home that's only worth nineteen thousand dollars, I mean, it's a lot mm -hmm. of complicated things. And to, and I'm saying is, how do we again, again, working and working through some of these um, layered challenges to be able to quickly get these dollars out into the community 
in a responsible way and in a responsible manner so that we can build up and restore our housing stock in communities that have been neglected and disinvested in for generations, right? I, I just, again, I, I understand this level of, we want to have a level of oversight, but I'm saying for as much as we've had oversight, how is our city looking like this? Thank you, Councilwoman House. Listen, I, I hear you, but I, I kind of disagree with you that, you know, that is, I'm hearing Councilman Harris, that, it, that, is, the, that is the concern. We want to make sure that uh, neighborhoods that, that needs it and, you know, if there's a need for more than 12500 that that, you know, that could happen, right? And we want to make sure that the support is given to uh, these communities that, you know, have had these problems where the problems uh, exceed 12,500. Um, and, you know, only way that we can really be able to, because there has not been, uh, in my opinion, real direct oversight on where these funds have been used and how they've been used, that's part of how we've gotten to this point, right? And so we have an opportunity uh, to, to really be more involved and really be more engaged on what neighborhoods and, and how this, this money is being used. Councilman Harrison, I'll go to the director. Yeah. Mr. Chair, it's, one, it, 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 it's lost on no one in this room that one of the reasons that we're in the situation we're in is because banks don't lend our communities, mm -hmm. right? We have this massive problem with undervalued houses, undervalued uh, communities, and then banks not wanting to make loans. And the only tool we have is the Community Reinvestment Act, which is a federal oversight tool, which we all know is failing to ensure proper, to invest, proper investment into our community. So I guess my concern is it would be foolish for us to set up a $10 million fund and then not have oversight to make sure that the money is getting into our community. We can all hope that our partners would be motivated by altruism and, and big hearts and, and Christian spirits. But at the end of the day, financial institutions like safe decisions better than risky decisions. And if we want to ensure that Huff and Clark Fulton and the Stockyards and, and, and Mount Pleasant are getting these investments, then Mr. Chair, we need to have some way to know where these loans are going before the receipts come in. Because if we wait for the receipts, we could find out that it didn't get spread equitably and fairly, and that would be a tragedy for us to, to lose $10 million and find out later. Thank you, uh, Councilman Harris. I yes. saw two faces. Yep, I'll go, I'll go. I'm a, all right, so um, through the chair, thank you for this robust conversation. Um, I definitely hear both, both sides. Um, I do wanna talk from a process standpoint to um, Councilwoman House's uh, perspective. Uh, there may be, and, and, and hopefully will be, homes that are over $50,000 that are in, in the biggest need um, that, that need this. Uh, it will gum up the process if we have to come back for each legislative piece. Um, it, it just is the reality of it. Um, that will take time. Um, we know running through this legislative process, that, that, that will be a lot. Okay, we'll be asking our partners for a lot to come back each time that happens. Um, this is, again, something that has been placed um, uh, on here from council's perspective, and I understand that perspective. Because I understand that we are not starting this relationship, even though I am a new director with you all, um, and, and in this administration, we're not starting from zero. We're starting from a negative place. We're starting from a place where there has not historically been trust. Um, and, and I get that, and, and so, um, but it is my job uh, to ensure accountability, right? It is my job that the contracts and that the program parameters um, and, and accountability to that is met. And typically we do that through reporting, typically we do that with, with updates to council. Um, and so uh, at, at this point, we're willing to do whatever it is as an administration to get these dollars out there because the need is great. But will it be most efficient if we are coming back for every $50,000? The answer is no. The answer is no. Um, but we are willing to do that um, because we need this program to be able to move forward because the need is too great, right? And so what that might look like um, is is, is gonna be uh, perhaps a whole lot of creativity between the department um, and our partners that 
cap it at a certain amount and then their dollars have to take over. That's why those leverage dollars are so important. Um, but I do want to make clear that it is my job and it is the administration's job to ensure accountability, that the programs are being followed, um, and, and that is something that I am committed, that, uh, that, that program parameters, that's what I'm committed to working with this council to make sure that you all feel comfortable with our partners um, to, to know that we would never allow something like that to happen. Thank you, Director. And I, did I just hear you uh, tell us the way that you are going to ensure that you don't have to come back to us by capping the dollar amount and then your partner kick in? Did I, did I if hear we, that? If we, would, if we would need to <laughs> to get these dollars out the door, uh, we would use additional leveraged funds. And it wouldn't be dollars from this $10 million. It would be those additional dollars that come in. Mm. It would cause us to have to be creative with how we, with how we do this. Absolutely, to get the dollars out the door and working with our partners, we would do what we would have to do. So that is the, the fix to circumvent uh, coming back to us. I, I, I hear you, I hear you, Whether it's different of a opinion. So uh, we agreed to that with Housing Gap Finance and I don't understand why you know that would be a concern here as I've committed to you that once you submit to myself and the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the staff, that we will work these projects through uh, to ensure that there is not a, a backlog. You know, we're not talking about on a single project basis, even if it's a slate of projects, right, as we've talked about uh, before, is acceptable. And as I've committed to you, I've been very, very, very uh, cooperative with the administration throughout this process. And so I just will hope that the administration will continue to be cooperative with this chairman and this council and this leadership uh, to work together to ensure that uh, we all play nice and that mm -hmm. we get these dollars out onto the streets, all right? Thank you, Director. Um, Sister Director, I saw the face. Did you, did you have something as well? Nothing from yourself? Councilman Harsh, are you, are you done? For now, yes. For now? Okay. And, and I, I do have one on that point. I'm, I'm so sorry, Chairman. Uh huh. Go ahead. If I may. Um, the difference here is with gap financing, you're going to have fewer very large projects. Here, we're going to have much smaller projects that might hit that fifty, um, that 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 fifty thousand dollar threshold. Sure. Um, I, I, and, and I, there's just so many more. Yes. Fewer. So where we're, we're looking at um, perhaps tens of projects with gap financing, we're looking at hundreds of projects through uh, uh, th through this process. Sure. Just, I'd offer an amendment, Mr. Chair, until we can get this fleshed out. Okay. We'll That's come back. Uh, we'll finish the question. We'll come back to that. All right. Thank you. Councilwoman Spencer, and then uh, President Griffin. I defer to you. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Chair, I will keep this brief because this has been really, really robust discussion, and um, I'm I'm learning as I go today too. I would say that there's enough detail here that we've talked about. I thought your questions that you opened with were outstanding, sort of fleshing out some of the definitions and defining some of the terms and the legislation. I think having some of that added to the summary, so when this comes to finance, it can really be mm -hmm. very clear to all involved some of the some of the um, definitions that are being used. Um, so um, I think that would be very helpful. Um, and I did have um, a question through the chair related to, or even you know, as another example, defining restricted ARPA funds a, a bit more clearly, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of the leveraging piece through the chair, does, does the administration have a sense of, is that gonna be on the lending side? Would, be, would that be on the grant making side? Or, or what, are, you know, what, what are we expecting? What kind of partners would we expect would um, have an appetite to bring additional dollars to this? Um, through, the, through the chair, we are looking to partner with nonprofits, uh, CFIs, financial institutions, uh, and, and we'll take as much as we can from whatever source that, that we can uh, that, that we can get it from to help leverage these um, these dollars. Um, so we don't have the specifics because we have not put the call out there to then get responses back. Um, but. You know, it, it is our goal to leverage those dollars on uh, in, in every possible way that we that we can. Mm -hmm. And then, thank you. And then, you know, 
Mr. Chair, I think I will just say, and you've heard me say this before, and I'll say it again, that um, I think the highest and best use of ARPA dollars is housing. And if, there, if it becomes clear that higher dollar repairs are what our community needs and we can get fewer units done, um, I think um, as, we, as the, the, the big picture of ARPA allocations come, in, come into focus and we're seeing how the buckets are lining up and you know, what things are costing, I think we could, I could see us coming back and adding funding to such a pool, right, for home repair in the future. I don't think we have to today say we're only ever going to get $10 million in home repair out of ARPA. I think we should, um, you know, until ARPA, until it's all been allocated, it's open. So, um, you know, my sense today when I'm here from my colleagues is that, um, you know, $12,500 12, per, per home is just not going to be, in, it's not going to meet the need, and we're not going to get to 800 units. Um, and so I just want to keep repeating um, that I'm always going to be open to more dollars for, for housing, and in this case, home repair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, you want to, yeah, Councilwoman uh, McCormick or Councilman Griffin? Thank you. Just a couple of questions. Um, one is, why did you decide to go outside of the city? Is it because of capacity issues? Uh, through the chair, um, yes. Uh, it, we are. We have a whole host of things that that we um, have to continue to do through through HUD. We've got dollars. We have systems um, al already, um, and so we're seeking to complement that. Um, what we don't want to happen is. Uh, you know, we are so focused on ARPA that we don't spend HUD dollars and we're sending dollars back. So what we're trying to do is increase our capacity um, through our partnerships. All right. Um, why wouldn't we just put this in the general fund and then spend down from the general fund? Because um, once it hits the general fund, then the same ARPA requirements don't require, uh, apply. So why wouldn't we just allocate and put it in the general fund and then have you guys come back and bundle? And basically, instead of trying to say come back for every $60,000 project or every $50,000 project, why wouldn't you just come back with a bundle or a whole package of actual projects that this is what you're asking council to do? So why wouldn't we just put it in general and then come back with a bundle, a package of how many of the houses you're doing so at least council can feel like it's some kind of way of being fair? Okay. Um, uh, through the chair, um, with ARPA, there, there is that restricted bucket and the unrestricted bucket. Um, you want to spend where you can th those restricted dollars, right? Because not all of the dollars can go through that, that unrestricted, through that process that you just mentioned. Um, these are eligible activities for those restricted funds. Um, and so we want to save those dollars for other initiatives that might not fall within the, the, the ARPA um, more stringent requirements, if you will. Uh, and beyond that, quite frankly, our, our department is used to even further stringent rules through HUD, and so we do have the framework and the ability to deal with restricted ARPA funds here. Well, I think the challenge that everybody's dealing with is that this is an unprecedented amount of money, mm -hmm. and I think that there has never been a time when the city has just wrote a check to ten thousand, ten million dollars. I apologize to any third-party organization and say, "Trust me." There's never been that kind of oversight. There's never been that way. And quite frankly, it's not just about council wanting oversight. I actually think this is an extra layer of protection for the administration and also for the public, because. We already have entities that once they do get their clutches on these dollars, they do whatever they want and we don't have anything to say. And quite frankly, I'm hearing that some of these places are going to be sending money back to the federal government. So I think that there's a way to be creative. And in my mind, I think that it's about maybe looking at three or four pieces of legislation to bring you know, several properties to us that are, you're looking at doing that goes through a process. Um, because I am very concerned that the squeaky wheel will get the grease. If you're talking about, you know, some of these folks will get, you know, come on board and they will um, 
take advantage of the program, but then other areas will lack, and then we got an equity issue all over again. Trust you, director, it's not just about you. I don't want anybody to think this is anything personal. I get out my feelings when I come to this business. But what I do want everybody to recognize is that at the end of the day, this council around the table is the one that's gonna get beat up. Nobody else has to run for election but 18 people in Cleveland City Hall. And once we go out to the public, we have to be able to talk about how this is done in an equitable way and how everybody got a piece and how everybody did that. So I think Councilman Harsh is right. Um, I think that Councilman Harrison is right. We want to be very careful that, you know, that this is not a way just to evade council and evade the process, which I don't think that's what you guys are trying to do. But I think we can be creative enough to either put the money in general fund that relieves us of having the restraints of ARPA because I'm getting concerned for the public and for the record, I'm getting concerned with getting these dollars out the door because we've been having these conversations for the last 18 months mm -hmm. and 2026 is gonna be upon us in no time flat and it's gonna be an embarrassment to the entire city of Cleveland that we had all this money and couldn't get it out in the streets. So. I just think that we got to be creative. It would have been nice just to do this in-house, and then we really could trust you because then we know that we have that working relationship. But you guys decided that you want to go with a third party, so we got to be creative. And I think that they should just come back with packages or put it in the general fund so that we could be a more flexible in that. Yep. Okay. May I? Yes. Yep. Through the chair, our, our, our goal here is not that 10 million goes to any one place, right? right. I see several programs here um, and, and several different partners coming to the table, right? So what the, what the lending institutions would do looks different than, than and, and the partners would be different than the other. Uh, and so uh, to us, there's, it has never been a, uh, here is a $10 million check and we'll see you in 2026. That, that was, that, that's, uh, that is not the, the, the point of this program, right? Um, this program is to get our partners. So let me, let me I, I, I do want to clarify. We have no problem coming back and saying, here's what the parameters of the programs are. Here's our partners. Here's how we're going to keep them accountable. Where I do have hesitation, major hesitation, is for every homeowner uh, every landlord, every resident that we are engaging with, that that comes back to this board and requires separate legislation, whether, whether it's on a whole slate or not. So the parameters of the program, the partners that we work with, um, those boundaries um, that, that we are within, I have absolutely no problem coming back to this board, working with this, with this council on to, to, to frame that. Um, where we, though, do get into sticky ground is when we're coming back every time. And I do believe that that does get in the way. And so I, I understand the accountability, but I want to make sure that the accountability, um, that, that we're not, what did we say with tax abatement? We're not letting uh, perfect get in the way of the good. Mm -hmm. I don't want to stop these dollars from getting out there or scare partners away, quite, quite frankly, if they feel like they have to, to, um, to come back through the legislation time and time um, a, a, again for each of their, essentially, how they would view it, projects or line items. So I think there are, um, we have a big program here in home repair. I see programs within that are for home repair, but the individual projects it is going to be uh, more difficult to come back with individual projects. And Mr. Chair, if I could, and I'll close sure. up by saying this, you know, government is messy. It's not easy. It's not an easy process. It's something that's messy. It's something that there are two branches of government on uh, in this building. And um, it's an oversight process. It's, it's the cost of doing business with the city of Cleveland. I know some people shy away from that because they think it's too bureaucratic and too bureaucratic of a process. But then we do get uh, criticized when we don't ask enough questions or that we don't have enough oversight. So the only thing that I would suggest, and I'm not saying write a check for $10 million and say goodbye, thank you. What I'm envisioning is that you'll probably have six or so partners, four or five, six, maybe even more partners. If they're putting out an RFP, it could be regional. 
It could be citywide. It could be a certain demographic that they're using that you guys can be creative and identify a program for seniors or for families with children or in a geographical area like northwest side, southwest side, east, northeast side, southeast side, and central. There's several different ways you can label it. And then those groups can actually go after those RFPs, bring back a bundle to say, this is how many houses we're going to do in this geographical area or for this demographic area. Now, you know your job better than I do, and you can come up with whatever imagination that you think you need. I think that if we did it some of those ways, there might be other dollars that can complement the dollars that we're putting in, but I do think that it's a way to do it, to not come back with every $50,000 house repair and have a line of people around the block trying to come back to get approval for that. That's not what I think we're envisioning, um, but we do envision some kind of way that we have some kind of say so and some kind of input in how this goes. Okay, Chair, I'll let you handle it from here and then we'll finish it up in finance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And again, I agree with everything that he said. And I hear you loud and clear. Trust me, I do. You, you and I talk a lot, right? <laughs> so I, I, I understand your point. Uh, but I, and I also understand Councilman Harsh as well, that I, and I happen to agree with both of them. Uh, as I've said, I've committed to you to ensure that there is no backlog, uh, as, as I believe the partner will still have to come back to the administration uh, for review and, and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, what's the terms you told, what, what you tell me? The flow chart that has the, the RFP partner coming back to you all for, I don't want to say underwriting or scoring, just, what did you for say? For the RFP, scoring. Well, once the once you secure RFP partner, they still have to submit to you all who they intend uh, to support for review, correct? It, it'll be within the purview of the program. So we set the parameters, they follow those parameters that we set. But you still review those that they send it to you for review, just like housing gap, correct? To ensure that, that, the, I, that I folks are we'll meeting the... Uh, guidelines that were created through the RFP in the department, correct? We will ensure that there is accountability and we will ensure that there's compliance to the rules that we've set out. Right. And so at that point, once it's coming back to you all for compliance review anyway, and once it comes back to you for compliance review as you receive them as a slate, you tee it up for us to come in for council to review uh, and move forward. And again, as I've continuously as I continuously say that I am uh, more than happy and willing to uh, call the committee uh, together as needed or find or going straight to finance for whatever we need to do uh, to ensure that we have no uh, no backlog but as you as you can hear that you know this body this committee is concerned um, and these concerns that are being shared are, are not new, that you all have heard these concerns. Your, your chiefs, I know they're listening, one just walked into the room, and who have heard from all of us about how we and, what, and, and the way we intend to, uh, to move forward, all right, and how we intend to work to make sure that, you know, we don't have any issues um, moving forward, okay? Uh, Councilman McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Been a really robust conversation, so I'll be very brief. Um, I just want to echo my colleague Jenny Spencer's comments and say that you know I think that um, it's a great start, um, but really interested from a policy perspective to ensure that additional funds are going into this work. Yes. Um, and I would add, I'd layer on to that that, and and this might not be a popular statement um, for all my colleagues, but I think that we need to prioritize historically redlined neighborhoods with these dollars. Um, because intentional systemic injustice is going to require intentional solutions um, to start to mitigate those issues. So I would just layer that on. Um, but once again, um, I would just echo Councilwoman Spencer in saying that great start, getting the program up and running, but I'd love to see additional dollars flow into this space because I do believe that stable, secure housing and wealth building through it is going to uh, tackle a lot of issues that we talk about at this table as one element. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman uh, McCormick. I do have another question before we move to Councilman Harsh. Uh, in Section 3, it, it talks about uh, the need to have authority outside of the scope of ARPA eligible projects. Can you, Director, Assistant Director, kind of dig into that a little bit for me? Uh, 
Um, so through the chair's sort of clarifying question, uh, the section 3 IC says um, that the director of community development is further authorized to enter into agreements with financial institutions. Well, maybe the, section 2. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, can, can you say what, what part again, Chairman? Uh, regarding the authority to um, outside of the scope of ARPA eligible projects. Yeah, that's what I'm Section two. Yeah. In section two. Can you say it one more time, Chair? I'm, I'm sorry. What line are you at? Uh, section two. So in section um, uh, two, it talks about. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Section three. Because we're on 899. I'm, I'm looking at uh, 898. 899, Section 3, um, why? Uh, it talks about the authority outside the scope of Arthur, uh, ARPA eligible uh, projects. So. Um, I don't, that's not. Line I don't 3 says for any costs that are not eligible under guidance paid right by city there. funding. So, so, so projects that fall outside of Section 2. Where I am. Authorized in an agreement under the project selected in accordance with Section 2 above for project of any costs that are not eligible under the guidance to be paid for from other city funding. You see it, Chris? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, Mr. Chair. I think what, what you're talking about is in, in Section 3, it says that the director is authorized to enter into agreements with institutions under the project selected in accordance with Section 2, so the same right. groups, okay. for projects for any costs that are not eligible under yeah, the guidance to be paid no. by other city funding. Right. So, so uh, that, that's what you mean by falling outside of our plan. Correct. That was a quick note. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Chairman, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll ensure to get that. Um, I, I, I am a little... I, because I was confused by that. Yeah. I, we'll, we'll certainly make sure that it's clarified. Um, but I want to I make sure that when we get it that's clarified that we, that we... Thank you. Hi there. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Good afternoon, to the sir. chair. Oh, afternoon. Yeah, yeah. geez. Okay. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, so I think that language is designed to allow community development to fund projects that don't meet the specific criteria of ARPA. So, and think about it, the restricted versus unrestricted money that, that gets talked about at the table. The ARPA guidelines, you know, set forth uh, requirements for what is eligible, right? Sometimes you need to be in qualified census tract, needs to be to low income uh, individuals, et cetera. There could be other work uh, that falls outside of those more strict guidelines that would still fit within the, the idea of the program. And so that's what that language is, is aiming to authorize. Sure. Okay. Thank you, uh, Director, uh, Chief. Chief Director. Whatever you like. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for that. And uh, will uh, Joe Titra just put that on uh, the list of uh, clarification as we, as we, uh, thank you for your, 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 your comments here. But as we, we just want to uh, dig into that, mm -hmm. you know, if we, if we, if there's concern from committee before we go to, uh, to finance. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, Councilman Harsh, I believe you have a couple of amendments that you want to, uh, to offer. Yeah. I, I do, Mr. Chairman, I, and I think that what I'm hearing from my colleagues, we're actually all in a lot of agreement here, and I mm -hmm. think that everybody at this table has a lot of, of, of agreements, but I would just caution us that it's better to govern with foresight than hindsight. I would rather prevent a problem than fix one, and we can, if, if third parties want to take on the responsibility of distributing government funds, then they're going to have to understand some of the responsibilities of government oversight, and I think that it's important for us to know that we, I mean, look, we just authorized $3 million in TIFs. We're looking at $15 million in home repair funds. We can handle large buckets. We can handle large amounts of money and deal with it in an hour or two. And if a, an hour or two at a time is what it takes to make sure that the money that taxpayers expect to go into our red line communities is actually getting into the right communities, and I think it's worth the oversight of this body to, to do that. And I, I agree with uh, Councilwoman House, and I agree with Councilwoman Spencer. I think there could be more money going into this later, but let's make sure we get the process done on the front and right so that we don't have problems on the back end. I would rather prevent a problem than deal with a problem. So there are two amendments that I would like to offer up, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, in Section 11, um, our standard oversight section, I'd like to add 
uh, at the end, all requests for proposals for any project or service authorized under this ordinance shall be submitted to council for approval. All projects that will be generated pursuant to this ordinance shall require prior council approval. Said projects may be submitted to council singly or as groups of projects. And then um, under section five, where we have a very uh, appropriate clawback, I believe, um, I think the final uh, line in that uh, with the deposit into funds determined by the Director of Finance um, should include uh, with legislative approval so that uh, we know what fund those, uh, those monies are being returned to. Thank you. Uh, Councilman uh, Harsh, do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. We have a motion to second any discussion? I will say... Can you repeat? Sorry. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, so I, your amendment to Section 5, can you repeat that? So Section 5 is a clawback that allows the funds to be returned to the city if unspent. And um, uh, the very last sentence, the return loan fund shall be deposited into the fund to be determined by the Director of Finance. Uh, I would add a comma with legislative approval so that we know which fund, which, which fund those monies are being returned to. Right. Where's going? All right. Uh, thank you, Councilman Harris. Thank you, Councilman Santana, for the, uh, for the motion and the second. Uh, is there any further discussion on the amendments? All right, see no further discussion on the amendments. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, uh, the amendments have passed. All right, uh, let me just get myself back in order here. There's a lot of paper up here. <laughs> uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you to uh, the director. Thank you to the assistant director. Thank you, Director Martin and Chief, for uh, jumping in to uh, uh, offer a comment. Uh, in a, is there anything further that you would like to uh, say as we uh, close this out? No, Chairman. Thank you for the robust discussion this morning. All right. Thank you and for afternoon. the absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, team. Again, we look forward to working with you to uh, flush this out. Uh, I believe you all are going to put together the flow chart like you did for the housing gap, and it will uh, speak to uh, uh, our collaboration on the RFP and all the other stuff that we, uh, we discussed. And then we will work to flush out some of the definitions and make sure they're attached to the final piece so that way there's no gray area understanding what a small landlord is, what, 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 what requirements they will have. Uh, and, and we may have to further amend uh, their finance to make sure that the alleged certificates, uh, no violations, all those other things, we t rental registrations are also uh, a part of the ordinance so that is understood and that is required you know, in order to support uh, um, a project. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Without uh, uh, no further questions, ordinance number 899-2022, uh, as amended, stands approved. All right. All right. Thank you. Oh. Actually, let me, I got to go back. There were... Uh, law, let's look at the law department. So these other, we have some other amendments that are here. Um, so we need to, oh. we need to take a step back. Yep. My apologies. So these are other amendments from the uh, law department that we need to go back. Sorry, I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm going to say Kimberly to somebody else over there. All right. Yep. So uh, just committee, just for those of you, we do have some members uh, from the law department that was uh, uh, introduced uh, to us. And so we're going to go back. We're going to uh, further amend uh, the piece. Uh, and Council McCormick is going to uh, motion those amendments. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Chairman, reverting back to 899-2022, um, I would like to offer five amendments to 89922. The first is in section one, first paragraph, line six, after assistance, insert two. In second paragraph, line seven, strike meeting and insert meet. In line 11, strike business who have experience and insert businesses who have experienced. That's an ED at the end of that. Number two, in section two, line in line five and six, strike eligible participants and insert eligible participants. Oh, there's a capitalization change there. Okay. Yeah. In both places and in line seven, after called, insert the. Number three, in section four, in lines two, four, and six, strike eligible participants and insert eligible participants with a capitalization difference in all three places. Four, in section five, line seven, strike initiative and insert initiate. 
Uh, five in section seven, line two, strike gap financing housing. Oh, it is. And that completes my motion. Thank you. We have a motion. Second. And we have a second for Councilwoman House. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Um, just looking to the law department, because we already did the first amendments, that's fine, right? And so we don't need to go back and do the, uh, the first two amendments, do we? It's different sections. So we, we, when we, we first had amendments initially, we, and we moved on, but then we had a second set of amendments. We don't have to restate those amendments, do we? No. Okay, all right, so we're good. So uh, now, going back to the uh, committee uh, and the, uh, the team here from the administration, uh, this piece has been further amended in ordinance number 899-2022 uh, as amended and further amendment stands approved, all right? Thank you all. My apologies about that. All right, ordinance number 898-2022 uh, by as amended by council member Griffin and Mayor Bibb in Hairston, uh, an emergency ordinance directing a portion of the city's coronavirus local fiscal recovery payment to the city's COVID-19 response by authorizing the director of community development to enter into one or more loan and grant agreements with various individuals and entities to finance affordable housing to address vacant and abandoned properties to be encumbered beginning March 3rd, 2021 and ending December 31st, 2024, to enter into other small agreements and to apply for and accept grants and gifts. We have Director Martin here as the lead, I believe, and uh, Director, Assistant Director as support. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a three uh, slide PowerPoint. I, f I think it's somewhere. Very, uh, very brief, and I promise I know that I'm what's keeping you from your lunch, so I feel, I'm good. feeling the pressure here. <laughs> We're here for the party. Yeah. Here for the party. Is it gone, gone? Yeah, I sent it, but it doesn't matter. Um, it's Do we, is it up there? Is it up there already? Director, is it this one that starts this way? Yes. It's on your tablets, everybody. It's 898-2022 summary, Arlette the Bell. Can you send it to Judge Hunter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 898-2022 well, summary, we, we, we do this, too, for the viewing public. That's the only oh. thing. Usually, that's why. For the folks watching. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. You got leftover fried chicken. It's all good now. I had a, I had a twelve o'clock meeting. I sent it over to council for Joe, I sent it to you. Three minute break. Three minute break. <laughs> Time for chicken. Just for those who are viewing, we're just trying to, we have a little technical difficulty. We want to make sure we get the information pulled up. Please stand by. Councilman Harsh, yes. will you please ask Ms. Carney what work she did? Yeah, 
Okay. Well, sure. Uh, <laughs> okay. She doesn't work three now. Thank you. Just I got it this way. The most wonderful one. Thank you. Said. That you need to work. Um, <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> She's got a yard. She's got a yard. She's got a yard. Um, Director, can I? Yes. Here we are. Two months ago, he completely transformed that place. I've driven past it two or three times, but I just haven't memorized it. Hesby is, is a, is a great, a great view. person. It's on Broadview. It's beautiful. No, I wish I had it. And we're sorry we don't have the before picture, but we will make sure we have that for finance, so before picture. Okay. So it has to be to send them over. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the first slide does show, in fact, Esby Madera, a rehabber who transformed this formerly derelict property into a stunner uh, for the neighborhood. And the reason that this came up is I, I was actually dri driving with uh, the Councilwoman Santana and we came upon this scene and, and we stopped and we went in and we walked through this property. It was really insightful because one of the questions I asked him was, how did you get the money to do this? Um, and he said that was an incredible struggle for him, that the money was the issue. And people like Esby have to go to hard money lenders right now to get the capital to do these projects, or they borrow from their own house or their family members or friends. And it's not an ideal situation. So the purpose of this fund that we're proposing today is to help rehabbers like Esby and others, including community development corporations, be able to have the capital to acquire and rehab in the neighborhoods that they serve, so that we're not as uh, victimized by outside investors who come in and pay cash for everything. We want a thousand ESBs working in neighborhoods throughout Cleveland. Um, so the second slide is going to show you the overview. And if you look at it on your tablets, you're going to see it much more clearly. And the idea here is to create a revolving loan pool to provide low interest capital for small, mostly minority contractors and CDCs seeking to rehab structures in places where private banks uh, typically don't provide funding. And we know that for many years, lines of credit for developers and rehabbers has been out the window 
um, since before, you know, around the foreclosure crisis, those lines all got pulled and people have not had the ability, which has led us to where we are now, being very much open to victimization by all of these outside interests who come in and pay cash. So in addition, one of the opportunities we have recently is through the state of Ohio forfeited lands, there are some salvageable structures. So we are trying to stand up some funds so that neighborhood rehabbers like ESPY can come in and renovate some of those properties and create affordable housing units, which as we heard earlier today are rare. And you know, we see a lot of market rate properties that are very expensive, but we need affordable housing for neighborhoods. Um, and so this, the intent here is to do that. Um, and so this third slide is showing you know, why it's needed, critical priorities and assumptions for this product. So bank capital, as I stated, for local rehabbers is difficult or impossible to obtain. And many of them are working with hard money lenders who typically charge over 10% interest with additional points. So they might charge 10 points to get that 10% interest product. So they're not making money, they're not creating generational wealth, they're barely eking by any profits. And Esby said the same with this house. He's probably not gonna make as much money. It was kind of a labor of love, but his profits are, are minimal here. So small developers with rehab skills want to work in familiar neighborhoods but lack the capital to compete with cash investors. Community development corporations lack capital to make strategic acquisitions in their service areas, and state forfeiture can provide a pipeline of properties with little or no acquisition cost. I did notice in the legislation it specifically calls out state of Ohio forfeited lands properties. Um, I would urge council to consider amending that to take that out because this really wasn't intended just, just to cover state forfeiture properties. I think we'd really be pegging ourselves into a small hole here. I think that is a a use, and it's a wonderful use, but I don't think it should be the only use. Uh, so critical priorities and assumptions is that this should be revol a revolving loan fund, not a grant program. So we want this to be an evergreen fund. Um, and it can be designed as a line of credit or a short-term short project-based loan underwritten based on the after rehab value of a specific property. Depending on the but, you know, experience of the developer. You know, should they have a line of credit or should it be a project-based one-time loan to see how they're going to perform? Um, developers should have skin in the game, probably at least 10% of the purchase price at a minimum. Funds can be used as part of a loan loss reserve to create leverage. So just in talking about the possibility of this fund uh, in the world, we got a lot of interest from people to leverage this money. I think this is going to be a very popular fund to obtain some leverage on. And the city would issue an RFP or a NOFA, you know, a notice of funding availability with flexibility to help shape the program designed to create the greatest innovation and can be layered with other funding like GAP to create a workable pro forma in weaker market areas. This proposal, as I said, I think is gonna go far with, with other funders and we have the potential to leverage it. And I think what's beautiful about all of this is that everyone in this room wants the same things for Cleveland neighborhoods. We just do. We are all working off the same playbook. How we get there can be messy, but I think the intentions are all the same here. And I think the market is responding. They're all very excited to hear this coming from the city of Cleveland. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And I know with as many smart people as we have in the room, we're gonna knock this one out of the park. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Director uh, Martin. Uh, is there anything from directors? Hernandez and Wacker, they're like, no, we, we didn't had our share. <laughs> it's all good. Um, we still love them. Um, just a few uh, uh, questions uh, from myself. Under section two <clears throat> of the ordinance, it talks about um, the director having the ability to enter into loans and grant agreements outside the scope of, of opera guidance, <clears throat> similar to what uh, we, we talked about in the last piece, the director is further authorized to enter loans and agreements with the individuals and entities to rehabilitate vacant abandoned property described in section one for any costs that are outside, that are not eligible under the guidance. Can you uh, provide some context on that? <clears throat> and, and because there is no dollar amount, uh, it doesn't state, state how the funds will be used, what, what they'll be used for, and, and, you know, is, um, and it's kind of authorizing this in perpetuity, you know. So just 
just had some thoughts around that uh, section. Mr. Chairman, in response, um, I would have to defer to law department who drafted the legislation more specifically because, you know, this is intended as a $5 million um, fund. So I can't actually answer the specifics of that. Okay. Um, not sure if the law department was here today. Can elaborate on that question or? or <clears throat> So in section two, it talks about the director being able to um, enter into loans and grants and agreements outside of the uh, scope of ARPA guidance. Specifically in the ordinance, it says uh, for any calls that are not eligible under, that, under the guidance. And so uh, my understanding is the law department put that in there um, and just we were wondering, wondering why that was in there and what is the, the need for that, you know, because it doesn't speak to a dollar amount, a, a limit, you know, what the phones would be used for or, or, or how the phones would be used um, and so forth. I didn't have anything to do with this, so I don't, I don't know the answer. Okay. Yeah. So it will apply, so that was my question. Does, does what, we, what we heard from, um, the finance director for 899 will also apply for this uh, as well. To the chair, that, that makes perfect sense. Okay. Uh, but I will say, uh, even though we received a response, I think we, we, we won't figure it out today because, you know, again, we're just, just allowing you to move forward. But I like a, what, I like a, what I would like for us to do is between now and once we hear this at finance is to work, uh, is to address, you know, whether we need to include a dollar amount, what the phones would be used for, and how the phones would be used, okay? So I'm, I'm okay with it. We, we're not getting that done today. But make a note that we will require that and have an understanding before uh, finance, vice chair of finance, uh, before, we, uh, before we move this forward, okay? All right. Um, also, second part, in the executive summary, it talks about a loan pool administered by the third party uh, selected by an RFP, but there's no language in the actual ordinance that speaks to a um, uh, third party RFP partner just as 899 did. Any? Through the chair, that, that is the intent, though, is to definitely RFP this. And especially if we could potentially do a, a no file where we could Mm -hmm. obtain some creative proposals as well as to how to get this out on the street be my best thought on that one. Okay. Because the other pieces that had intended to use a third party uh, partner through RFP uh, process, that was noted in the other, um, the two pieces, but not in here. So I just, I didn't, I didn't understand why that was not included, if that was the intent. Through the chair, we will regroup with the law department to, to make sure those tweaks will be made. Okay. Um, for me, that's 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 fine, and we can we can make sure that that is uh, that that is done. Uh, on that question only, if there's a question from the committee regarding that, yeah. yeah Councilman, Mr. Chair, yeah. So just for clarity, so because I was going to ask the same question, so mm -hmm. there there it is the intention to have a third party distributor of these funds as well, um, through the chair to the director. Uh, but, Mr. Chair, there, that's just not in here? That, I, I just don't see it. It's, it seems to be missing. Correct. So it, it made it to the summary, but not the actual ordinance. So as the director said, that is their intent. That's what they are, are, are looking to do. And so uh, the team will regroup with the law department to get that fixed and corrected uh, for the piece. I'd rather not do that now because I want to make sure that the language is correct and that we're not just drafting a quick language to put in here uh, because we won't lose anything by uh, passing this out and, then, and do that before finance. Councilman. I'm sorry, I'm confused, Mr. Chairman. Does that mean that we're tabling? Or is it, no. What would, you be your, 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 what would be the no, intent I, here? The question was, and, and Director answered that, they, that is their intent, and they have, after this, they will regroup with the law department to get that language together. And so I'm okay with that, that we're not throwing together some quick language today to make that happen, right. to, to make that correction but allow the team to work with the law department to get the correct language that speaks to having an RFP partner that will be amended and financed to be included in the piece. It's not here today. Okay, so They're going to work with the law department to get it done. So we don't vote on this? No, we will. We do. We're just, just, the, just the point about the RFP and the third party partner. It has to be added later. Yes. For finance on Monday. There's no section. It's not included at all. Right. Okay. It's in the yeah. other one, but not included. Correct. Okay. 
Yeah, I didn't know that we were allowed to do that, but I got you. Yeah. But you can amend it. I, I, I didn't know that we could pass an ordinance number that would be so different from one that would be amended later. I thought that we had to be in agreement with the finance committee. This is just um, freshman blues here. You Sorry. Said that with the finance committee? I didn't know that we could pass something that would then be altered dramatically by adding a section later on. I thought we had to be in agreement, but this is just legislative learning curve. Sorry. And, and no, we don't have to be. We could, so the amendments can be made here, and amendments can also be made in, in finance as well. Councilman McCormick. No, I was just going to note, too, yeah. So we'd be approving the ordinance to the audit committee with the understanding that prior to finance that the legislative language needed to, to satisfy the chairman and the committee would be agreed upon prior to I finance. See. Or right. else, when we get to finance, our chairman would say, yes, this is the language we discussed in committee. I support this amendment. Or the chairman would say, no, this doesn't satisfy the committee's intent at DPS. Correct. And then we could revert the ordinance back to DPS for further discussion, uh, or we could do that work within finance. So it's, it's essentially approving the uh, ordinance out of this committee to, to go, green lighting it to go to finance with the understanding that these changes would be made. I hope somebody at home has learned what I've just learned. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Two and three, it looks like. Yeah. Not in right. So the, the summary speaks to third party, as the director indicated, but somehow it, it did not make it into the ordinance. And so oh, I, I would just feel more comfortable not trying to rush that in now that we let the team and, and, and council work with the law department to make sure that language is correct mm -hmm. and that it's added in as in the manner that Council McCormick just, just narrated. I understand. Then I'll offer the same amendment yeah. to this ordinance. Right. Okay. Um, that is, and then section five of the piece, as we've done before, we've, we, we, we've, we've striked uh, the forbearance uh, piece, which was no concern for the administration uh, as, it, as we did in the previous pieces. Correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, open up to committee for questions. Councilman Harsh. Offer a. Uh, you got a minute? We'll oh. come back for that minute if there's any more questions that you have. Well, so you, you clarified my big question, which is I thought this was being run in-house because the, the language was missing. Um, and, and then the, I believe the director just answered my other question, was this is not going to be targeted specifically to state forfeiture houses. We're going to remove that language so that we can do more than just state forfeitures. I thought that was very interesting, but a very small window of opportunity. I looked this morning, there's only 890 state forfeitures. Right. That would limit our pool. Um, that's all, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Spencer, nothing. All right. <laughs> yep, I think she's, she, they answer all of our questions. Anything else from the committee? Another question from the committee? Uh, Councilman Harsh, uh, I believe you have uh, two amendments, I believe. Yeah, Mr. Chair, we we'll offer two amendments to this. Um, for 898, uh, to delete section five, as, as previously mentioned. The other amendment would be to section 11, um, which is still 11. Yes, it's still 11. Um, to uh, amend with the same language from, the, from 899. And I should read that again, Mr. Chair. Read that out again. And there's another one if you oh. don't mind offering. Okay, should I read the same amendment again? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the uh, add to the f section 11. Uh, all requests for proposals for any project or service authorized under this ordinance shall be submitted to council for approval. All projects that will be generated pursuant to this ordinance shall require prior council approval. Said projects may be submitted to council singly or as groups of projects. And then a third amendment um, in section two, line two, strike into the, and insert to enter into, which was the administrative. Yeah. Did you say delete section five? That, that is correct. Is that the forbearance. That's the, the forbearance. That's only for 898. Okay. Correct. So it's section. Correct. So for section 11, we added the same language to 898 as we added to 899? Okay, in section At the end of section 11. Okay, so you don't have similar language that you added in section 5 with legislative approval? Correct. Nine. Section 5 in this one is different from section 5 in the other, correct. Wow. Section 5 in this one is deleted. No, that's yeah. what I said. All right, so we have the... 
thank you, Councilman uh, Harris. We have the three amendments, um, uh, section two, line two, strike, uh, the insert. We have the uh, delete section five as entirety, dealing with forbearance, and you also the uh, initial amendments regarding uh, submission of projects and RFP. Correct? Correct. They've all been. All right. Do we have a second? Submitted. I'll second. All right. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? All right. No discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right. Thank you all. Um, anything further as we wrap up from the uh, team here? Thank you so much. All right. We look, this council looks forward to working with uh, uh, both departments to. <laughs> Both departments to uh, uh, really uh, bring ordinance 898, 892, 899 uh, together. Uh, department is going to send us a flow chart for this as well and how the process is going to go and how we will all work together. Uh, all right, and seeing for no further discussion or comments or concerns, ordinance number 898-2022 as amended stands approved. All right, thank you all for your time and patience today. I think this was a, a very uh, robust and well done, very, uh, thank you, uh, uh, a good discussion for those who are here and those who are listening. So we look forward to working together, all right? All right, take care. Committee adjourned. Councilman Harsh. Right there, just a quick question.